much, Grace. Uh, well, welcome, everybody. Hey, everybody. Sorry to interrupt the enjoyable conversation, but we got to have a meeting. So uh, we'll call the meeting to order for the afternoon of October 18th. Grace, would you please call roll? Jimenez? Perales? Cohen? Here. Carrasco? Davis? Esparza? Here. Arenas? Here. Foley? Here. Mayhem? Here. Jones? Here. Licardo? Here. Quorum, thank you. Thank you. If you're able to stand, please join us uh, for the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you. Uh, today, uh, we'll have a little different presentation for our invocation. Uh, Council Member Foley is going to tell us about the District 9 star recipients. This is a little departure from your typical invocation, but I've been doing this for four years, or for three years, this is my fourth year, and I'm just gonna continue on with that because I like showing people and awarding people for doing good things. So every year since I assumed office as part of my invocation responsibilities for the month of October, I honor members of the community for work they do to make life better for those around them. This award is called the District Nine Stars. This is tradition that was started by one of my predecessors, Vice Mayor Judy Churko. She was city council member three, peop three council members ago, I think. And I'm really honored to continue this in her legacy. Former Vice Mayor Judy Churko introduced the D9 Stars program she when she was in office to highlight the generosity of our neighbors who go out of their way to make a positive difference in D9 and throughout our community. Each year, we ask our residents to nominate those in their community who make a difference by quietly going about their work to make our community better than the day before. My team and I review these submissions and make the selections. We look forward to reading all the stories that are submitted about these unsung heroes. These individuals quietly go about their work, many not seeking any recognition, but today they're gonna get it from us. All of the applications we received are worthy of this re recognition, so limiting them to three was pretty difficult this year. This is now my fourth year carrying on the tradition of recognizing those that spread positivity, altruism, joy, love, and kindness in our own corner of San Jose. So, for today's presentation, I proudly present this year's District 9 star recipients. And the mayor, you've already done your job, right. which is distributing the commendation. Way to go. And please, and we have a little treat for them, too. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about each of them. The first is Andrew Goldberg. Andrew was nominated by Jill Travis. Andy, Andrew brings smiles to the community as a creator and teacher through music, art, and science. Andrew teaches free saxophone lessons to middle school students so that no child faces financial barriers pre preventing them from learning how to play music. And he's only a senior in high school. Isn't that awesome? During the pandemic, he printed and delivered over 300 hand-printed figurines to nursing homes and a children's hospital to let those people know that someone was thinking about them. He utilized his 3D printing skills to create safety guards for all the teachers in the Campbell Union High School District to prevent teachers from hitting their emergency buttons on their classroom phones. Andrew has also led a hackathon for the district. I'm not sure about that one, Andrew. Where students, maybe you have a job with our IT department later on. Where students get together on one small team to create a coding project. He's worked tirelessly to find enough company sponsors so that the event would be free for all students, including meals and snacks, and is currently planning another one for next year. 
I am commending Andrew Goldberg for his above and beyond efforts to improve education at San Jose schools and for putting smiles on the faces of community members, both young and old. Congratulations, Andrew, thank you. Next, I'd like to introduce you to Melissa Ojcik. She was nominated by Don Clavin. I think I mispronounced Clavon. Clavon? Melissa leads the Cambrian Educational Foundation, a group of volunteers dedicated to raising funds to provide students with enrichment programs necessary to create well-rounded educations that prepare them for success. As a busy parent herself, she has been an outspoken proponent of Cambrian School District and community, carving out time to prioritize other families in the district. She leads an annual fundraiser and community building readathon event, which supports mental health resources across the district and has raised over 55,000 in the past two years. She's made it a priority to be a bridge builder and collaborator who puts children first and helps make a true impact on the community. I'm honored to thank her today for her tireless efforts to improve the quality of education for all of our students in the Cambrian School District. Thank you, Melissa. And after I read this last one, you can sense a theme that they are all supporting children in some way, shape, or form. So the final awardee this year is Viviana Barnwell. She was nominated by Laura Chavez. Viviana advocated for families of children with disabilities to support inclusion and access to services, and by ensuring that the experience of people with disabilities are shared and included in discussions. She has served on the lived experience group for the city's COVID task force and, a member, and is a member of the state's council on developmental disabilities. She hosts meetings to teach parents about the implication of their children's diagnoses, as well as about the disability service system and advocacy. Viviana is bilingual in English and Spanish and champions inclusion by bringing awareness to the disparities people with disabilities face, especially those in other minority groups. Today, I am honoring Viviana Barnwell for her advocacy to make San Jose a more accessible city for everyone. Thank you, Viviana. Thank you all to this year's D9 Stars. Thank you for all of you who give back to the community. And if you live in District 9 and see good work, please think about nominating them for a D9 Star next year. Thank you. All right, uh, Councilmember Carrasco is with us remotely, uh, and I know she would like to recognize and proclaim Filipino American History Month. Uh, we were just having a wonderful flag raising event last week, and welcome to our community members. Take it away, Councilmember Carrasco, if you're able to hear. Thank you so much, uh, and thank you. I, I want to uh, welcome everybody uh, who's joining us today and uh, just mention that Council Member Sparza is doing me the favor of presenting the commendation. Uh, uh, more than anything, because I'm so grateful uh, to be able to have this opportunity, and I wanted to make sure that someone was there uh, presenting. So I want to thank Council Member Sparza for doing that. Thank you, Council Member Carrasco. Hello, uh, my name is Maya Sparza. Council Member for District 7 and filling in today for Council Member Magdalena Carrasco, um, who led this effort, wonderful effort, uh, just can, is unable to be uh, to join us in person today. So since 2009, October has been designated as Filipino American History Month as a time to raise and honor those legacies created by our Philam community. 
the Filipino American community carries with them a rich history of fierce advocacy, diverse traditions, an intense sense of justice, and an incredible culture. As we've had such a broad spectrum of trailblazers, we recognize labor leaders Larry Itliong and Philip Veracruz, who helped spark the Delano grape strike. Actors and celebrities like Vanessa Hudgens, Alex Mappa, drag queen Manila Luzon, and influencer Bretman Rock, who bring Philam representation to our screens. Singers like the mega talented Bruno Mars and Olivia Rodrigo, who reign the charts, and our very own Attorney General, Rob Bonta, who prior to being the Attorney General, was the first Filipino American to enter the California State Legislature. These are just some of the icons that have cemented the Philam ta talent into the great tapestry of our country. And our country and region owe the Filipino American community a great debt of gratitude. It was those labor leaders like Larry Itliong, Philip Veracruz, and the Menongs who played a pivotal role in the labor strikes and grape boycotts. They organized groups of Filipinos to strike against the grape growers of Delano, California, alongside Mexican-American leaders Dolores Huerta and Cesar Chavez, thus revolutionizing socioeconomic relations between Filipinos, Mexicanos, Chicanos, and many other workers that will last decades. Councilmember Carrasco wants to say that we're proud that we've enshrined this great legacy by naming one of the city's newest park, as Delano Menongs Park. And excited to share that the Delano Menongs Park is now open to the public. Located at the corner of Jamali Way and Beechnut Drive, this park provides a super fun playground, tons of seating, and an intractable sign sharing the history of the thousands of Filipino farm workers who organized and participated into the, in the 1965 Delano Grape Strike. And here in San Jose, we recognize and honor the work of those in the canneries, in the fields, the trades, our first responders and our laborers everywhere. And especially we'd like to share our gratitude to the Phil Am nurses who selflessly helped our community heal and make it through the brunt of the pandemic. This was especially important for the east side of San Jose who experienced the highest rate of infection and death in the county. We mourn those you who have lost and profusely thank you for your service. And what a joy to present today's proclamation Where is he? to the city's own Ron Muriera and former D7 Arts Commissioner um, with the Filipino Americans Coming Together or FACT SJ Coalition. FACT SJ, a local collective behind several cultural initiatives in San Jose, included the annual Filipino American History Month Jam Music Festival, Pinoy Town Walking Tours, and Jeepney Jam. Fact SJ has been working round the clock to ensure that our Filipino American community is well equipped to succeed. Council Member Carrasco and our whole city council are extremely grateful for the presence you've all developed here in San Jose. Please help me welcome Ron Muriera to say a few words. Thank you very much, Council Member Esparza. It's proud to represent D7 as an Arts Commissioner for eight years. And thank you, of course, to Council Member Magdalena Carrasco, who has, for the last several years, sponsored the Philippine flag raising in honor of Filipino American History Month. It was gonna be me solo, but I put out the call to our fellow Filipino American City of San Jose employees who are here representing. And if you don't know, our community is a significant part of service to the city of San Jose. I'm in my 10th month and proud to be now serving the city of San Jose as the arts industry support director in the Office of Economic Development and Cultural Affairs. So I'm now on the other side because when I used to accept this award, I accepted it as a community member, which I do representing the entire community, but it means even more now that I'm an employee of the city of San Jose. I just wanna share with you a couple of milestones. One, is that the Filipino American National Historical Society funds. Um, we're celebrating 50 years of Filipino American studies. That's significant. 40 years of Filipino American National Historical Society, the organization, and 30 years 
of Filipino American History Month. And the city of San Jose was one of the first Bay Area cities, I get a little emotional, to acknowledge the Filipino community and Filipino American History Month through a flag raising and through a celebration. Why is this date significant? Because on October 18th, 1587, the first documented people of Asian descent set foot in what is now known as the United States. Luzonos Indios, the indigenous people from Luzon, from the land now known as the Philippines, were our crew members on board a Spanish galleon that landed in Morro Bay, California on October 18th, 1587. While we have no other information about the surviving seafarers, we do know that Filipino sailors continued to travel between Mexico and the Philippines from 1565 to 1815. So we've been around for a while. I just want to close by reading an excerpt. President Joe Biden has graciously acknowledged Filipino American History Month nationally, and I want to share with all of you a portion from the letter. Throughout our nation's history, Filipino Americans have played an essential role in writing the American story, from serving our country in uniform, starting new businesses, and advocating for workers' rights, to working on the front lines of the pandemic as healthcare workers, first responders, and educators. Filipino Americans have always worked to make our country free and fair, strong, noble, and whole. When Filipino American history is preserved and shared, the millions of Americans, Filipino Americans, that helped build this country can see themselves in the story of America, in a story that makes us better and more united as a nation. Just as they have fought to preserve and share their history, may we all support, celebrate, and honor their contributions. On behalf of all the Filipinos here in the city of San Jose, Thank you so much for acknowledging Filipino American History Month. Mabuhay. Member Sparza staying right here, but we're going to welcome uh, members of the Franklin McKinley School District to join us for a commendation. Come join us. So honored today to recognize the Franklin McKinley School District for their partnership with the city in hosting the city's satellite eviction help center at the Franklin McKinley District office in the heart of many of the zip codes that were hit hardest by the pandemic and the ensuing economic crisis. The Franklin McKinley School District's partnership with the city goes back nearly 30 years, some of us might remember uh, more than others, and has always, always focused on serving our youth and families in areas of high need. So this most recent partnership of the Eviction Help Center is really part of a continuation of a long-standing legacy of collaboration between the school district and the city. I know it seems right now like forever ago, but let's just return just a moment to the summer of 2021. We were racing, racing to get folks va vaccinated while the Delta COVID variant began surging, while continuing to deal with the destructive economic fallout of an economy that was just beginning to open or reopen. And we were leading the countywide effort to keep our residents fed on top of this. We were facing the horrifying prospect of some 40 thousand low-income families and individuals at imminent risk of eviction. And so we were facing several crises all at once. And our housing department acted nimbly to get our city's eviction help center set up 
that summer so that we could ensure as many tenants as possible were getting access to emergency rental assistance and to legal assistance and services to keep them housed and prevent this tide of eviction, uh, evictions that we faced. And knowing that the city was looking to open a satellite eviction center in our hardest hit communities that would be directly accessible to families that needed it the most, the Franklin McKinley School District stepped up and generously offered a site in their district office. The Eviction Help Center opened in August 2021 and offered assistance to struggling renters five days a week. And this site contributed immensely to our successful citywide effort to ensure that through our combined state and local programs, over $137 million in assistance has been provided to over 12,400 households to keep our residents in their home. I'd like to thank, in particular, Superintendent Juan Cruz and the Franklin McKinley School Board of Trustees. And we have four of them with us today. We have Maimona Asfalberta, uh, Rudy Rodriguez, Manuel Martinez, and George Sanchez. Thank you for being with us today. So honored to present them with this commendation. And I'd like to invite, um, I don't know who's gonna say a few words on behalf of the school district. Thank you, Council Member Esparza, and thank you, City of San Jose. Um, my name is Rudy Rodriguez, and I'm Vice President of the, the School Board. And on behalf of the School Board and the District, um, it is quite an honor for us to, part, to continue our strong partnership with the City of San Jose and provide the, uh, the eviction center available to our residents. Many of our residents in the Franklin McKinney School District are low income and in need of help. And this is another service that the district office is, is able to provide the, uh, our, uh, the parents of many of our school children. And, and we really appreciate this partnership. And um, we absolutely have an, an outstanding superintendent who is able to coordinate the partnership and the uh, effectiveness of the eviction center. So I do invite Superintendent Cruz to come forward and say a few words if he'd like. Thank you. Um, you know, one of the things that we, we strive in Frank and McKinley and, and with the support of our board is to make our school district, our schools, the hub of the community. And this is one way that we can do that by bringing the resources into the community to break down the barriers and of access to our families. And so we're always eager and willing to pr provide um, the space in the partnership with the city. And so we continue, we hope to continue that partnership. Thank you very much. Right, I see Council Member Foley lurking, so that means she's up next. Uh, we are going to recognize and proclaim National Disability Employment Awareness Month. Yeah, lurking. Thank you. I'm bringing up my guest from Hope Services. Good afternoon. I'm Council Member Pam Foley and I represent Council District 9, but you knew that because you were here 15 minutes ago when I made my presentation for the District 9 stars. Should have given you a test, but I'm actually here now to and honored to recognize this October as the 77th annual National Disability Employment Awareness Month. This month is used to educate the general public on issues that workers with disabilities face how employers can be more inclusive in their hiring practices, and to commemorate the many contributions of people with disabilities to America's workplaces and economy. When this celebration began in 1945 as just a week-long celebration, it was called National Employ the Physically Handicapped Week. The removal of the word physically happened almost 20 years after the first celebration, 
before Congress officially expanded the week to a month and became the name we now know today to acknowledge individuals with all types of disabilities. Environmental and attitudinal barriers have led to stereotyping, discrimination, and ableism when it comes to the employment process for many of these individuals. And I want to share a statistic with you. If disabled workers experience the same employment rate as those without a disability, nearly 14 million more persons with a disability would have been employed in 2021. 14 million, imagine that number, that staggering number of folks with disabilities who are not able to get jobs or very fi find it very difficult to get jobs today. As we continue to rebuild an economy that is still recovering from the pandemic, we must remember that this cannot be completed without the inclusion of the talent and drive of these individuals with disabilities. People with disabilities constitute the largest minority group in the U.S., making up an estimated 26% of the total population. So while we have already made great strides toward an environment that advocates for these individuals in the workplace, we must also consider the diversity of this group. This diverse group crosses lines of age, ethnicity, gender, race, sexual orientation, and socioeconomic status, all of which contribute further to the inequity of opportunities individuals with disabilities already face. With this proclamation, I want to reaffirm the City of San Jose's dedication to ensuring barrier-free access and opportunities for all. We will continue to take steps throughout the year to recruit hire, retain, and advance individuals with disabilities. We will continue to ensure that our workplace promote courteousness and mindfulness of differing needs. Every individual deserves a work environment that provides them the, ab them the ability to equally participate comfortably and effectively. Today, I'm proud to have Sue Ann Rinta, Maya Barakat, and Blanca Nara, Lara here from Hope Services. Hope Service is Silicon Valley's leading provider of services to people with disabilities and mental health needs. Hope Services offers comprehensive training and employment services, including job development, placement, and on-the-job coaching to support around 400 clients daily in competitive jobs agency-wide from Monterey to Menlo Park. Mayor, Mayor Licardo, would you please present them with the commendation? And I'd like to ask Suzanne to speak. Thank you very much. Again, um, we're really honored to accept this proclamation, and I'm really doing it on behalf of the individuals with developmental disabilities that we um, provide um, support for in the community that are, that are working. Um, and I think as you heard, um, it, employing people with developmental disabilities is, a, again, an incredibly underserved um, population. And we're hope, this is our 70th year um, of providing services, the Hope Services. We're celebrating our 70th anniversary. And employment has always been key to our mission. So I would definitely sort of, um, sort of challenge you to really, those of you that are doing employment, look at your employment workforce, look at how diversity just really empowers and improves any workforce um, make makes your employee employee site better and here at hope um, we'd be more than happy to i'm going to kind of get that little plug out there for any employers that are looking to meet your hiring needs right now i know it's difficult to find employees we have ready and able workers that want to contribute to your to your team and are just, would just be phenomenal additions to your workforce. So definitely reach out to agencies like Hope Services or other agencies. Again, we're really looking to absolutely can fill your, your employment needs. And again, thank you very much for this, uh, this proclamation and honor. Okay, for Pedestrian Safety Month, National Pedestrian Safety Month, uh, 
Vice Mayor Chappie Jones is demonstrating by walking up here uh, how to safely, please. Yeah, take it over, Vice Mayor Jones. Thank you. On um, September 16th, a traffic fatality occurred in my district as a third grader was walking to Castlemont Elementary School, part of CUSD, and he was with his babysitter. The news of Jacob Villanueva's death has left us and the entire San Jose community heartbroken. When a life is lost so young, it leaves us all shaking and grasping for answers. Our heart and condolences are with Jacob's family and friends as we grieve this devastating loss. The crash is currently under investigation and we should know more in the weeks ahead. Though rare in the city of San Jose, this is not the first time our community has experienced this kind of devastating loss. I, along with the mayor and council members Cohen and Foley, have brought forward some recommendations that focus on traffic safety in our school zones. These recommendations will be considered tomorrow at 2 p.m. by the Rules Committee. As an effort to recognize the importance of pedestrian safety, we are here today to recognize October as National Pedestrian Safety Month as determined by the U.S. Department of Transportation. In 2019, 19 pedestrian fatalities were recorded in San Jose. I understand that that number is growing this year and has continued to grow since 2017. One loss of this magnitude is unacceptable. We must commit to take proactive approaches and work together with neighboring cities, community members, and organizations, our school districts, and the County Office of Education to improve pedestrian safety. In that spirit, I have invited Dr. Mary Ann Dewan, County Superintendent of Schools, and Dr. Shelley Vera Montez, Superintendent of Campbell Union, Union School District, to accept this proclamation. So I just had a few words. Those of you that know me know I always have a few words. Um, so thank you, Vice Mayor Jones, not only for this, but for your partnership with the district, Mayor Licardo, and San Jose City Council. As was already mentioned, our school district, our Castlemont Elementary School community, uh, whom I have the principal, Kristen Prindle, here with me, suffered a, a great loss as little Jacob Villanueva tragically had his beautiful eight-year-old life cut short as he did what thousands of our children do every single day in our city, walking across a crosswalk. I want to applaud you for recognizing the importance of pedestrian safety and your willingness to raise awareness for such an important issue that literally impacts every single resident of our city. From drivers to pedestrians, we all have a role to play in ensuring that everyone crossing a street can do so without threat of life or even worse, life-ending tragedy. Although this is a complicated issue that neither cities or school districts can solve alone, by working together, we can work to make sure San Jose is one of the safest cities for pedestrians in our county. Lastly, before closing, I would also like to thank Vice Mayor Jones for his leadership in leading the charge to bring forth a memo that begins the process of pri prioritizing safe routes to school. Tomorrow's vote before the Rules Committee will be a strong first step towards the implementation measures that will help protect the children and families of San Jose's school districts. I respectfully urge you to support this memo. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Dr. Mary Ann Dewan. I'm the County Superintendent of Schools. And I, again, um, also echo Superintendent Veramontes' comments of gratitude 
to um, Vice Mayor Jones and to all of the council members and the mayor for bringing forward this important effort and initiative. I am a member of the v Vision Zero Task Force and I attend the meetings to work together to address safe routes in our community for cyclists and pedestrians. And I offer my urgent support of the recommendations to address safe routes to school for the hundreds of thousands of students and children and families that live in the city of San Jose. Our hearts go out to the family and to everyone at Castlemont Elementary School affected by this recent tragic loss of life. I am grateful to the parents, the volunteers, the crossing guards, and our police partners who work to make our children's routes to school safer. And I believe that more can and should be done to ensure the safe passage to school. We at the county office and the broader schools community appreciate this call to action for a collaborative, thoughtful approach to improving children's safety on their way to and from school. Achieving this goal will require close collaboration between the city's experts in traffic management, the police and the school communities themselves, and the administrators, staff, and the parents who walk their children to school each day are invaluable in determining what the safety issues are and how they can be addressed. As the Vision Zero Task Force addresses school safety, I strongly encourage you to begin by engaging with the schools, community, and districts across the city to benefit from their lived experience. And I and my team at the county office stand ready to partner in any way that we can to ensure safe passage to school. And again, my gratitude to the council for bringing this forward. All right, on orders of the day, um, item 8.2, uh, staff suggests to be dropped, um, which is the amendment to the fiscal year annual action plan for transfer of neighborhood stabilization program income funds to CDBG uh, for eligible uses. Um, so that would be dropped and I assume re-agendized another week. Are there any other changes the council has to the printed agenda? And I'm gonna ask Grace or Tony if they could look online to see if there are any of my colleagues are raising their hands? There's no hands. Okay. Then with that, we'll entertain a motion to the orders. Move to approve. Second. All right, let's vote. Jimenez? Yes. Perales? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Carrasco? Carrasco? Davis? Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Licardo? Aye. Thank you. All right. Uh, on to the closed session report. Nora? Thank you, Mayor. Um, coming out of closed session today um, under Government Code Section 54957.1A2, 
Uh, we received authority to initiate litigation. This, the uh, name of the action, the parties, and the substance of the lawsuit will be disclosed to any person upon inquiry once the action is formally uh, commenced. And then we also received authority to settle a pending lawsuit. And that settlement under the city sunshine rules be, will be coming forward to um, public session for approval and direction to enter into the settlement agreement once it's prepared. Thank you. Thank you, Nora. Let's go to the consent calendar next. Are there items that the council would like to pull from the consent calendar? I'd like to pull item 2.8. I'm looking for any other colleagues. See none here. I'm looking at the hands. I see no colleagues uh, who are raising their hands either. Is, and is that 2.82 um, for separate consideration or just for comment? Uh, I guess just for comment and question, uh, I, I intend to vote for it. Okay, so that way we, I'm, I'm just asking based on public comment. On oh, I we, see. Yeah. Uh, so if it's just a comment, then we'll just do all together. Okay. Uh, why don't we take public comment then at this time? And this is for the full consent calendar. That's right. Matthew Tinsley. Uh, oh, excuse me. Matthew? I, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm still here. The, I had a, a brief technical moment. Um, the Santa Clara County Office of Education would like to state our support for item 2.12, creating the position of early childhood aid instructor and specialist to serve in the Parks, Recreation and Neighborhood Services Department. Quality early learning programs require well-qualified and well-compensated staff. And by creating these positions with the associated qualifications, you're demonstrating your ongoing commitment to quality and to the youngest learners in San Jose. Thank you. Okay, back to the, the, the council. Great. I just wanted to pull item 2.8 uh, for a couple quick questions. If uh, Jennifer, uh, someone from Employee Relations might be available. I, I, I know that there's been a lot of focus on how we can address the challenge I think departments throughout the country are having in terms of recruiting um, officers and um, on this police lateral incentive, which I very much support. Um, I, I just wanted uh, some clarification about um, whether uh, this is something that's unique to our city or, or something we're seeing in other cities as well, uh, that is challenges with recruiting um, and, and retention. Sure, Jennifer Shembury, Director of Human Resources and Employee Relations. This is not unique to us. I'm aware of a couple other agencies that have lateral incentive programs. Um, I'm not sure any that are really close to us, but in the Bay Area, yes. Right, and, and in terms of the challenge generally with um, recruiting, uh, I know that our police academies have gotten smaller in the last two years or so. Uh, is that something that we are seeing in other cities as well? Yes, that's my understanding is that um, this challenge with, with police recruiting is, is across the state nation. And um, we are still attracting some laterals, that is some current officers from other departments. Is that true? Yes, we have had, um, I believe, about six laterals so far this year. Um, and I do believe there are some in the pipeline. The police chief is here may have better numbers than I do, but that's okay. what my recollection is. That's great, thank you. And then the finally, because I, I, I support this, and I, this is important, I know, because we're, I think, dealing with a smaller pool of qualified people here that uh, we need to re recruit and attract. But I know that this could become something of a race to the bottom among cities if we're all trying to just steal each other's uh, um, officers. And I'm just wondering, how, how do we prevent this from becoming that, <laughs> uh, where cities are simply re upping the, the ante uh, to recruit other officers. Do you mean increasing the lateral incentive in yes, other agencies? Yes, to the point where it just becomes somewhat um, counterproductive at some point. Well, I think we'll have to monitor that, but I don't think yeah. a lateral is gonna come here only for this incentive. I think that there's a lot of that San Jose offers that other agencies don't that would attract people to come over here. This is just one kind of addition to that. 
Okay, great. Well, thank you very much. Appreciate your work. All right. Um, is there a motion on the consent calendar? Move approval. Second. A motion and second. Council Member Sparza and then Foley. Don't see any hands for comments, so let's vote. Jimenez? Yes. Perales? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Carrasco? Aye. Davis? Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Aye. Foley? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Licardo? Aye. Thank you. Thank you. All right, let's go to the report of the city manager. Jennifer? Thank you, Mary. I have no report today. All right, succinct as always. Um, item 3.3 is the city manager's annual report. There will be a presentation. Welcome, Jim and team. And as they're gathering, I just want to do a shout out to our city manager's budget office, headed by Jim Shannon and all their staff for an a, incredible year of uh, managing the budget for 21-22 and all the work that went into preparing this annual report for the city council and with that i'll turn it over to jim thank you very much jennifer uh, good afternoon mayor members of the city council again my name is jim shannon i'm the city's budget director i'm joined up here by uh, bonnie duong our assistant director selena ubondo our financial status coordinator and bryce fall our operating budget coordinator so uh, a big component of the senior management team here today. Uh, so um, together we're gonna provide a brief overview of the city's 21-22 annual report, which, com which uh, complies with the city charter and the city manager's vehicle for summarizing and analyzing the city's budget performance for the preceding fiscal year. The report is pretty technical, but it does provide um, a very comprehensive budget to actual uh, comparison of revenues and expenditures um, in each budgeted fund for the last year and as appropriate, explanations concerning material differences between those amounts. It also provides the city council with a comparison of estimated actual ending fund balances for all funds, as well as a summary of the 21-22 year end reserved by fund. And then based on this analysis of prior year performance, updated information in the current fiscal year and past direction from the city council, we uh, recommend a number of adjustments in 2022-2023 for council's consideration. Did that go too far? It didn't. Okay, great. Uh, so. I did. There it goes. Come on. There we go. Uh, so overall, revenue performed generally as expected, um, and on an overall basis, expenditures ended the year within or below the budget. Uh, the the general fund uh, had a, a surplus, um, along with most other funds that ended the year um, at balances above or at estimated levels. And when we look at, and we'll talk more about the general fund a little bit later. Uh, but after rebudgets and cleanups, the general fund fund balance was about 1.6% of the modified budget, which is a pretty pretty close 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 call. Uh, and uh, we're going to, as part of our analysis, we're, we're you know uh, we'll be recommending various actions in 2022, 2023 to close out 21-22, uh, adjust the current budget as necessary in accordance with City Council Policy 1-18 recognize a variety of grants and reimbursements. And then we do have a few um, urgent needs in the general fund and in a few special and capital funds that we'll talk about a little bit later. Here, just want to, uh, just a couple of quick highlights on the big picture economic conditions. There's a lot of things that we monitor in, in the budget office, but, but do want to just highlight a couple of them here. Uh, one of them is employment. And you can see from this graph here that we are sort of back to pre-pandemic employment levels as of the end of June. Um, obviously, the economic picture is changing, um, and so this is definitely we're going to keep an, an eye on it. But it's it's definitely notable that we're we're above pre-pandemic levels, and even when you look at our unemployment rate uh, of 2.3 percent back in June, uh, is um, is below where we were before the pandemic and above the prior years of 5.5 percent. Real estate, as folks know, was really strong uh, for all, all of 2021 and for this, the first half of 21, 2022. You can see it on this graph here that looks at medium home prices as well as property sales. This is a really good barometer of how the real estate market is, is going. Uh, so uh, the, at the end of June, uh, the single family medium home was 1.6 million, which was 5.6% above what it was in the prior, uh, at that same time last year. But sales certainly have fallen off um, over, you know, from the January to June period, sales were down about 12% from where they were from the, the prior year. So um, as the Fed raises the interest rates and the corresponding mortgage rates rise, um, that's definitely going to have an impact on the real estate market. 
as will potentially any other economic impacts in the valley. So we'll definitely be keeping an eye on this as we go forward. Looking specifically at some of the revenues in the general fund, uh, which kind of shows our, our top four here. And really as property tax and sales tax goes, so goes the general fund. Um, those were all performing well um, in 21, 20, 22. And uh, utility tax and business tax, uh, a little bit more steady there. And we'll talk about those in just a moment. But I just wanted to kind of show the big picture there between the property and sales tax and sort of everything else. Kind of doing a year-over-year -year comparison, this is kind of a, a, an interesting chart. You can really see the impact of the recovery from the pandemic in 21, 20, 22. So you see the percent change on the very right-hand column there indicates some pretty significant growth in a lot of categories. Um, you know, particularly we'll just mention sales, sales tax, where, um, which is a really tricky one for us. So, you know, Selena over here is responsible for most of the general fund revenue es estimates, though we arm wrestle over uh, a few of them. Sales tax, we really uh, uh, went back and forth on because we got some information in May of 2022 based on the performance of January, February, and March. And so we had sort of 20% quarter over quarter growth over already really heavy growth. And so, okay, well, what's the fourth quarter going to look like? Because we don't get that data actually until August. And so really went back and forth, back and forth, and we ended up being really good. So we, we called that within uh, $60,000. So that was pretty, pretty impressive there on sales tax. We were a little bit, um, we had a little bit extra in the various other categories compared to the budget to the estimate, but um, that was good because you might remember last year we had a, we were here last year and we had a huge um, surge in sales tax growth that caught us all by surprise. So this, this year we had a little bit more of a warning and we're able to plan for it as part of our, uh, our uh, budget process. A couple other things to note here, uh, business tax, you see a pretty big jump there in business tax. That's mostly because of the card rooms were fully operational in 21, 20, 22. Uh, fees and charges is the same thing. So we had a lot of programs that weren't really operating and now in 21, 22, they were. Um, similarly with fines and penalties, we had some uh, parking citations was the biggest driver there. Uh, T T TOT actually ended the year better than we thought, which is good. So we had a year end estimate of 9 million. It came in at 10.5. And then we had the monster year for the real property transfer tax. Um, huge, huge growth there. We have that estimate for 22, 23 down at 65 million. We're really gonna keep an eye on that. That's really influenced by how um, large property transfers go. So we'll have to really keep a close eye on that. And I'm gonna turn this over to Bonnie. Thanks, Jim. Um, so the general fund ended the year with a gross fund balance of $559 million, um, of which $51.4 million was above the estimate that we had used to develop the 22-23 adopted budget. Um, this represents 2.4% of the modified budget. So after we do all the net required adjustments to close out 21-22, the ending fund balance variance was $33.7 million, which is 1.6% of the modified budget. Additional fund balance was primarily generated um, by stronger anticipated revenue performance in several small categories, such as fees, rates, and charges, utility tax, card room business tax, and TOT. And then um, we also had expenditure savings in all of, all of our categories, um, mainly in pr personal services. And we had some in non-personal equipment, citywide and capital. So of the um, additional fund balance that was left over, um, this is the proposed allocation of that fund balance. Um, started off with $51.4 million. And then after all the required adjustments, um, of $17.6 million, we had fund balance of $33.7 million. That's recommended to be allocated um, by um, $19 million for the required technical uh, rebalancing actions. And those actions um, align already with approved revenue estimates and expenditure adjustments um, with the most current tracking information, reallocates funding for ongoing appropriations based on updated needs and information corrects technical issues from 22-23 adopted budget or complies with actions previously authorized by city council. Then the next, um, the next category we have is grants, reimbursements, and fee activities, which resulted in, um, it's a net zero action, but it resulted in a net reduction of $125,000 in both the expenditure side and the revenue side. Then we allocated $4.5 million to two urgent fiscal and program needs, which we'll discuss later on, um, which then leaves a remaining fund balance about $10.4 million. Um, that remaining fund balance is being recommended to be distributed per the city council policy 1-18. Um, so $7.6 million to the budget stabilization reserve and then $2.8 million to the IT sinking fund reserve. 
So of the $19 million that's allocated um, for required technical rebalancing actions, here on the slide is just a list of some of the larger adjustments that we're recommending. Um, $5 million to the contingency reserve, um, which brings it from $41 million to $46 million. And this is in accordance with council policy 1-18, which provides for the maintenance of a minimum 3% contingency reserve in the general fund to meet unexpected circumstances arising from financial or public emergencies um, that requires immediate funding. Um, so just wanna note that the contingency reserve um, adjustment is usually made as part of the annual report, um, but the $5 million is a relatively high adjustment. And this is mostly due to the significant amount of funding that was allocated as part of the 22-23 proposed budget process. Um, the little bit of additional beginning fund balance and sales tax, sales tax revenues that was recognized and allocated at the end of the year. And a significant amount of expenditures rebudgeted as part of the adopted budget process and as part of this annual report. The next item here is the $3.8 million um, that has been set aside in the fire station and FF&E reserve. Um, and this is also in accordance with uh, the mayor's uh, budget message, with direction from the mayor's budget message um, that sets aside um, available excess general fund ending fund balance to help address future cost overruns anticipated um, from these measure two capital improvement projects for fire station. Um, so fire station 8, 23, 32, and 36, and the 911 call center upgrade projects are tentatively scheduled to be completed within the next five years. As of spring, um, the projects were anticipated to exceed the current budget allocation by a total of two to $4 million and anticipated to need an additional $5 million for FF&E. So that brings uh, the total cost overrun to about seven to $9 million. And with this adjustment of the 3.8, um, it helps bring that down, uh, that, that need down. The next adjustment we have is uh, $3.78 million that's being transferred to the City Hall Debt Service Fund uh, to reflect um, a correction for a 22-23 allocation change um, and then to also correct the allocation cost related to the August 2020 lease revenue bond issuance. And then we set aside $1.4 million in the Community and Economic Recovery Reserve to replenish funding to prior levels um, and provide sufficient funding for, cities, for the city's potential financial commitment toward the I isolation and quarantine program managed by the county. And we have $1.25 million for the City Hall Rehabilitation Project. This one repurposes um, project savings from the City Hall campus expansion that must be um, reallocated for infrastructure improvements at City Hall. $750,000 for the Fire Station 8 Garage Demolition and Site Cleanup Project. Um, it demolishes an, an abandoned garage behind the fire station and um, helps with the slope stabilization there and the erosion control. $700,000 to establish the police helicopter engine overhaul reserve, which will support required maintenance of the helicopter's engine and provide for the installation of a rental engine to ensure little to no downtime for the air support program. And then we have net zero adjustments um, in business tax where we're increasing the carbon business tax revenues by 2 million, but then decreasing the cannabis business tax um, by $2 million. Great, thanks Bonnie. Um, so all the things that Bonnie just went over were uh, required, we call required technical or re rebalancing actions, things that we sort of have to do as long as there's resources there to do it, as well as prior council direction. We, we do have a couple of items that the city manager is recommending as an urgent and fiscal program need that would normally be uh, brought forward as part of the proposed budget process, but we think they, they're really important and need to be brought, brought forward now. Uh, so the first is $3 million for homeless management services, uh, which is you know, an, an issue that the city council and community and administration has been you know, grappling with um, in a lot of in, in, uh, innovative ways, as well as um, uh, trying different you know, policy and program uh, uh, processes to sort of get at uh, the, the challenges that we are dealing with here. And so we do have $3 million that is set aside um, to be able to um, address issues that we have passed council direction on, including um, uh, potential uh, issues related to um, an RV parking ordinance and manage RV, RV parking, um, some security um, after abatements have taken place, 
uh, potential uh, abatements along creek, creek sites. So a number of, of, of actions, we wanna make sure we have some funding in there that we can flexibly use. We'll also be coming forward um, as part of a number of actions on um, November 29th in response to prior council direction to recommend some more specific funding from this allo allocation. And then we have 1.5 million for uh, the fire department uh, to enact a, a lateral uh, fire, fire paramedic academy. So about $900,000 or so, or about a million dollars for overtime for instructor costs and about $500,000 um, for equipment and supplies for the academy. Um, as, as council is aware, we do have a pretty significant shortfall in active para paramedics. And so this is an intent to try to be uh, aggressive and to have a new uh, paramedic academy in early 2023 um, to try to shore up some of those um, uh, ranks. And then so after we do all of those items, we have about you know, $10.4 million remaining balance. And so the city council policy 1-18 tells us how to distribute those. Um, and so we need to be looking for either uh, adding to our next year's projected deficit reserve, which we don't have a projected deficit, so we don't need to do that. Um, look to allocate funding to the budget stabilization reserve, trying to get up to an overall general fund reserve level of 10 of 10%, and also to look at our unmet deferred infrastructure needs. And so based on that, we're coming forward with a recommendation of uh, 7.6 million here for the budget stabilization reserve. We'll would take that reserve up to $61 million. And when you combine that with the general workers' compensation liability reserve and our contingency reserve that Bonnie talked about, we'd be at a level of about 8% in the general fund, I mean, kind of the highest in memory, really, um, and uh, which is a really good place to be at. Um, uh, when you, you think about all of our general purpose reserves, especially as we start heading into potentially recessionary period. And so having that backstop is super important. It was also a little bit of unfinished business that council directed us as part of the March budget message to set aside funding in the budget stabilization reserve. We did some, but we really needed to do more. And so this gets us much, much closer. Um, and then we do have $2.8 million going into the IT sinking fund reserve for a total amount now of $6.5 million. One of the primary uses of that is to eventually replace our FMS and ERP system, which is gonna cost more than 20 million. So trying to shore up some, some funding there. And just a, a couple of touching points on a couple of other major um, city operations. We have um, the airport um, definitely had a pretty good bounce back year from where it was in the pandemic. So passenger activity increased by over 130%. Um, and revenue performance exceeded the budget estimates by over six, six million. And we've got um, a pretty healthy passenger activity projected for 22-23, so good news there. Also some good news in the San Jose Clean Energy Fund, which was um, a little bit of a rocky start over the, the last year. And we're able, with the uh, rate adjustments enacted by the City Council back last December and the lower PCIA cost, um, the fund balance ended at 80.6 million and we're currently projected to end the current year at 171 million, so which is really good news. We need to get our reserves up in that fund. Uh, looking at some of the capital revenues we have here, uh, building and structure and construction excise, the blue and gold bars, a little bit of a downward slope. Those are revenues generated from private development construction. Um, and so, you know, ended the year sort of at budget, maybe a little bit better, but we end up taking that budget down over the course of the year. So we need to keep an eye on that downward trend. The gray bars is a construction and conveyance tax, heavily influenced, of course, by the real estate market. Super strong year, a record year in 21, 2022. We expect that to come down pretty significantly. Uh, in 2223, I think we have an estimate of 50 million, 50 million, um, and it came in at about 65. And then we have just a number of other, uh, I mean, a number, a bunch of other uh, cleanups and recommended adjustments throughout all of our city's funds that we did all of our closeout analysis. Maybe just a couple others that I'll, I'll highlight is because TOT did come in better, we do have some adjustments in the TOT fund because uh, we had sort of 2.3 million dollars of revenue in the TOT fund, uh, which enables us to. Um, allocate some additional funding back to uh, the Convention Cultural Affairs Fund or Fund 5536, as well as to Cultural Arts and Grants and the CVB. It also allows us to uh, take down the transfer from the American Rescue Plan Fund to Fund 536 um, because it doesn't really need that help anymore, which is good because we had assumed some savings as part of our overall budget plan for the AR ARP fund, which didn't really materialize yet. And so we were able to capture that savings of 1.5 million without having to um, make any other allocations or adjustments within that uh, program. So I think with that, this is quite a bit. We'll, we'll pause here and just again, wanna thank our senior management team and everybody in the budget office who puts, I mean, this document comes together in about three and a half weeks. And so really just really appreciative of, the, uh, of my team and all the department staff who works with us to put this document together. Thank you.
<clears throat> Thanks, Jim. That's about 100 pages a week. It's impressive. All right. Uh, let's go to the public. Blair Beekman. Hi, uh, Blair Beekman here. Thanks for uh, your mid-October meeting today. Uh, I guess to start off, uh, just a, a thank you, uh, you know, for this item, a yearly report. Um, I, I've spoke, there were a lot of items on the consent calendar that I've spoken about over the past few weeks that I hope you can remember <laughs> at this time and, and can be useful to yourselves in how you voted for the consent calendar of the, for its items. With that said, um, this, this uh, report, it offers a, a nice broad range of uh, city programs that uh, you're, you'll be working on uh, in this past year and hopefully into 2023. Uh, to quickly offer, I'm real sorry about the events of uh, uh, four uh, deaths that have happened this past week around pedestrian issues. And uh, I, tomorrow's meeting uh, around Vision Zero issues will be uh, really helpful and important, I think. And you guys know my feelings about the importance of uh, having open, accountable public policies and practices along with the technology. And, and when you do those things together um, in what will be possibly a, a year in this year and next year of a, a lot more surveillance technology than previous years um, and it's budgeting, good luck how we talk about uh, open public policies. It doesn't have to be a fearful subject. And that's, that's an important concept I hope we can all better work towards tomorrow and uh, and this fall and into our future. Uh, with that said, to talk about uh, future, oh boy, I got lots of cards here. To talk about a future of uh, city manager items, it's my sincere hope, I've spoken often here, that uh, into the next administration, we could learn to talk about the city manager role at public, at uh, when she speaks on agenda items at the beginning of each meeting, that can be a time for public comment. I hope we can learn how to expand the public comment time a bit more and at least have those conversations. Thank you. Jill Border. Hi, um, I was listening with great interest uh, to all the, the adjustments that are being suggested and possibly voted on. And I just thought maybe we could have some type of a fund in the future where when these adjustments are being made, we go back and we say, hey, what are the things that were brought up at the at the last budget hearings that were not addressed that people really in the public were were pining for and so one of them of course we'll talk about later so I won't bring it up but the 8.3 you know we'll talk about later but it seems to me that there's some extra money and that certainly when um, a group of people in the public something's been voted on and you know say two years ago unanimously to make it happen maybe that we could have a fund where it says it's like it called an integrity fund or accountability fund or something like that where when we when we have pandemics happen or we have unforeseen events happen but we've made a commitment to the public maybe we could draw upon those funds to fill that gap instead of putting it out uh, what appears to be maybe years into the future so just a suggestion it seemed like we had a little extra money to play with thank you back to the council okay uh, thank you appreciate the input from the public I want to assure everybody there's no extra money. <laughs> we wish there was, but we got a lot of other needs, um, and we're not funding them. But we're uh, we're doing a pretty good job, at least, uh, uh, really preparing for what we know is a, is a tough. Uh, is likely to be a very tough economy next year, and I really appreciate the work uh, of Jim and Bonnie and the whole budget team, uh, Jennifer and her leadership for over the years, um, being able to get to eight percent of operating reserve uh, operating expenses now in reserve um as high as it's been since at least i've been here in probably in a couple decades uh and um we did it through some tough times and i appreciate that it was hard to do uh, i think next year and the following year the council and the community will be very grateful uh because this is what's going to help us weather the, the tough times and, and keep people employed and keep services in place so i, I appreciate everybody pulling together to make that happen um council member Arenas? Thank you, Mayor. I, I agree with you. I, I think we, we need to be very conservative about what we do with our funds. Um, and I think our administration has been very thoughtful 
Um, it's reflected in, in this memo. One of the things that I wanted to actually focus on and just um, really commend both Jim and, um, and our city manager, Jennifer, and the folks in, in, in Jim's um, department is there was a concern earlier this year about overruns, construction overruns for our fire stations and uh, council member Carrasco and I uh, submitted a memo uh, for, to ask for exactly this, to, to prepare for some of the things that we are anticipating are going to increase and that is con construction costs. And so um, I'm absolutely just grateful um, that we're doing this ahead of time and, and not risking um, something to our fire stations that are in the pipeline of getting built, but we're anticipating this, this overrun. And so I'm, I'm absolutely just grateful. Thank you so much for, for finding this, for prioritizing this. Of course, there was a memo that we wrote, but, but you making it possible um, is just absolutely um, wonderful. Uh, not only for our, our fire department, but really for our whole community because it, it allows us to manage other funds in ways um, that can benefit um, everyone uh, within uh, the measure T parameters. So so anyways, I just wanna, once again, just thank you. Uh, everything was wonderful. Thank you so much for being so considerate about our city and, um, and how we are uh, prioritizing our, our budget. Thank you. Oh, and with that, I will um, make a motion to approve. Second. All right, thank you, Council Member. Looking for other colleagues with their hands raised. If not, I'm gonna jump in with questions. questions. Oh, okay. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I see physical hands, but not virtual. <laughs> so I'll go all the way to my right, Council Member Cohen and then Council Member Foley. I just realized that I'm logged in as you and I didn't have a button to raise my hand. Uh -huh. so. oh my I was God. wondering why I couldn't see anybody. I'm gonna log out. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> um, <laughs> I know since all the staff showed up, I, should, I need to ask somebody a question. <laughs> um, but thank you so much for that and, and, and the stewardship of the budget. And, and it's, it's good to see that things are healthier. It's such, it's such a volatile time. It's really hard to really know what's happening now, what's gonna happen next year. But, it's good to things, see that things came out on the plus side in most cases this year. We don't know what's gonna happen next year. My, I have one question on one item. I saw that the on the clean energy reserve fund is the ending balance now is pretty significant up to 170 million. There was a target, I just don't remember what it was. There was a target for that number at which point we are able to begin to invest in things like incentives for conversion to electricity and doing uh, EV programs. What is that number that we're aiming for? Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Lori Mitchell, Director of Community Energy. Um, you're right, that number um, is about 180 million. So our operating expenses are about a million dollars a day and we are targeting 180 days of operating expenses in a reserve. Um, we are planning to bring forward a reserve policy to Council in December. And so that's something that you can consider formally there. So that one, we're, it looks like we're at 170 according to the estimates, is that right? Yeah, we have to get to the end of the fiscal year. At the end of the fiscal year, we'll be at 170. And then, and then hopefully if things continue to do well, we're at that point where we can begin to start investing some of those the extra revenue in some of those programs, is that right? Correct. Okay, thank you so much. All right, uh, yeah. Council Member Foley. Thank you, Jim. Thank you for the report and the uh, review of the annual report numbers. While I realize this is a snapshot for the end of the fiscal year, which is a full almost six months ago, I'm more concerned about looking forward. So I really appreciate the efforts in this, in your uh, adjustments to put aside funds in reserves. You mentioned earlier that we, we like to have 3%, uh, and that's of the general fund, I'm assuming, not of all of our funds combined. Yeah, and, and just to clarify, so we have, we have uh, two 
percentages that we have to hit according to council policy. So the one that we have to get is a contingency reserve. That needs to be 3% 3, 3 of general fund operating, budget operating expenditures. We have a policy target of 10% 10, 10 um, for all of our general purpose reserves, which is the contingency reserve plus the budget stabilization reserve plus our catastrophic workers' compensation and general liability claims reserves. All three of those, we want to equal 10, 10%. We're now at eight. Okay. So we're close, but we're not quite there, but I still feel good about that, given where the concerns of where the economy is heading and our need to hire more employees and compensate our employees uh, appropriately in order to retain and, and, uh, and attract. So I, the, the two numbers that I'm honing in on the future, and I realize this is a look back, but I'm looking at future, and those are the two that are related to real estate values and real estate transactions. And that's the property taxes, which we, we won't yet see a reduction in property values or property tax assessments until 23-24, because the tax bills are already out for this year, and it was based on a July 1st number. So while uh, there's a projection of a drop in real estate values in the residential market anyway of as much as 20 percent that's going to affect the transfer tax number and it eventually it will it will affect the property tax number so how do we because we're we're starting to rely on the measure e transfer tax and had a, a quite a good number of, a uh, good amount of income last year, 110 million, uh, but do you have ideas on where that number might be in the coming year? I know it's kind of hard to predict, but market is dropping and there are not as many sales. And, and what are may not be triggered by the measured E transfer tax. Yeah, correct. Um, yeah, it's, it's going to be an interesting year for that. You know, we do have very little experience with, with this tax. This is really just our second full, full year of it, I think. So, oh. um, you know, we had 110 million in 21 20, 22. We knew that was not going to last. That was heavily influenced by some pretty large commercial property transactions. Um, we have it at 65 million currently. Um, right now, we're on track to meet or it, exceed it. So, right now, through you know, the data that we have, we're really good. It just really depends on what's going to happen later on. It's really dependent on if you just get a few large property transfers, you're sort of good. If you don't get a few of those, you're in the hole. Right. Um, so our, our intent when we came up with the city council policy governing Measure E, because Measure E is a general fund revenue source. We, we allocate it for homelessness prevention and, and support and affordable right. housing. Um, our intent is to try to budget that relatively conservative so we don't get overextended. Um, we do have a, a, a good chunk of money in reserves that even though we have plans for it, isn't necessarily committed. So you know, even if it does fall short this year, we're not in an immediate sort of panic mode. But um, we will be monitoring that very closely. We come out um, every every uh, couple of months with a bi-monthly financial report. We'll we'll keep an eye on that for sure. That goes to the PIS PIS committee, um, and then we'll have a better idea of where that's going when we come to you for the mid-year budget review in uh, fe early February. Thank you. I I appreciate that. I'm I'm very concerned about where our economy is headed. You know, the stock market's not reacting positively to things. And to what's happening in the market, and a recession uh, will be, well, it's already, I don't, I don't know if they've called a recession yet, but it sure feels like one because our dollars aren't buying as much. So I, in, in the budget process next year, we will need to, and council will need to be very conservative about allocating funds to any new programs or even considering new programs because it, it's, this is the time to tighten our budget and to hunker down in, in our, and, and depend on our, not depend on our reserves, but build our reserves and have them there because we may be in a time where we're gonna depend on them. So I really appreciate that we're at 8%. Look forward to, get to getting to 10%. Do you have strategies on how, on how we're gonna raise that by 2%? <laughs> <laughs> no? Uh, well, uh, council direction would always be great. So yeah. here we go. <laughs> can go to Vegas and double it. Yeah, no, I'm not <laughs> not a proponent of that one. That sounds a little risky, and I know you meant that in joke. Okay, that's it for me. Thank you very much. All right. Um, I'll note that since Councilmember Cohen is no longer usurping my computer, uh, if there's anyone else who'd like to raise their hand, I can see your hand now. Nope. Okay. I just had a couple questions. Um, 
The, uh, going back to fire stations first, yeah, great to see the, the 3.8 million allocated for either FF&E or I guess to fill some of the gap we have in Measure T. It looked like from the report the gap could be as large as 9 million and that includes both FF&E and overruns, is that right? That, that's right at the time we had the estimates. I mean, I think that's gonna be changing potentially. We've been you know, continuing to evaluate where the Measure T program is. Um, yeah. we, we do have direction to come back to you all in um, early 2023 calendar year to give some more specific recommendations about where we're at and how we can try to close some of the gaps. Um, you know, it's, it's more likely that that gap could grow rather than shrink. Yeah, okay, you anticipated my question. Sounds like we, we're continuing to get more recent data. Okay, thank you for that. And then also speaking of fire stations, and um, somebody from fire may want to speak on this, because I don't expect you to be an expert on this, but, or maybe, maybe Matt could help. Um, I know we're, we're, we're throwing in 700,000 to take out the garage on station eight, but I'm hoping we'll begin construction, well, not immediately, but I know it will be soon, on section eight, or station eight's replacement along East Santa Clara Street. I guess my question is, why wouldn't we wait and demolish everything at once, assuming that would seem to be cheaper rather than doing it piecemeal? Thank you, Mayor. Matt Kano, Director of Public Works. I will need to follow up for the, to spe the specifics, but the, the garage is separate from the rest of the fire station. It's back behind, behind the actual fire station building. It's a separate, separate building, and there are, um, so I'll have to follow up to see, to get a better answer to your question about why we can't wait, but I think there are environmental reasons we need to get rid of that sooner rather than later. Okay, yeah, I guess it's all going in the creek eventually. Um, is there, uh, is the demolition of the station itself part of Measure T budget today, or is that something we need to go find budget for? It's not currently budgeted. Oh. So we'll have to figure out figure that out as we go. So that may or may not get demolished. I think Soon. it will need to eventually get demolished, but yeah. we still need to figure out the financing for that. Um, I will go back and check on that as well, though, and follow up. Okay. Thank you for that, Matt. Um, and then I had one last question. I guess it wasn't a question, just a, uh, a note of joy that uh, Measure E revenues, uh, the affordable housing revenues came in so high, $110 million last year. I know we won't probably see that number again for a while, but uh, boy, do we need every dollar. So I'm uh, really grateful to the residents of our city for supporting that measure uh, and for all those who came together um, uh, to, to make that happen, uh, particularly uh, at home, at SoCon Valley at home and, and their, the whole team uh, that uh, got that over the goal line. Okay. Um, any other questions before we vote on Councilman Aranis' motion? All right, let's vote. Jimenez? Yes. Perales? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Carrasco? Aye. Davis? Aye. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Ricardo? Aye. Thank you. All right, thanks everybody. We're going now to Item 3.4, uh, annual merit increases and additional executive leave for council appointees. Now I'm supposed to read the following out loud. So as recommended by the Rules and Open Government Committee on October 5th, 2022, uh, the recommendation is to adopt a resolution approving a 2.5% merit increase for the city manager, city attorney, and independent police auditor, city clerk, and city auditor, effective July 1st, 2022, and 2022, and granting an additional 40 hours of executive leave to each of these council appointees for the payroll calendar year 2023. Okay, let's go to uh, the public for comment. I have no hands up. Let's go to the council. Is there a motion? Move approval. Second. Okay, motion from Council Member Sparza, second Council Member Cohen, let's vote. Jimenez. Thank you. Perales? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Carrasco? Aye. Davis? Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Foley? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Ricardo? Aye. Thank you. All right, item 6.1 are power procurement agreements. We do have a presentation. Welcome, Lori. 
and team. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. I'm Lori Mitchell, and I'm the Director of Community Energy, and I'm very pleased today to be jo joined by Kelly Morris. She's our Senior Power Resources Specialist, and of course, Kit Parkness. So today, this request is for the authority to purchase power for the years of the remaining months of this year through 2027. So you have seen a version of this item many times uh, before council. So what we are recommending in total over those five years is an additional $405 million in additional authority to purchase energy, renewable energy and resource adequacy, as well as low carbon products for the period of 22 through 2027. As background, this authority is needed to meet our customers' electric demand, and we are recommending to approach the upper limit of our energy risk management coverage ratio. You can think of that as our expected load or how much energy our customers utilize. And we're recommending this to reduce our exposure to market volatility. Um, procuring ahead allows us to reduce um, our exposure to these short-term market disruptions that we've seen in the recent past and our exposure to high prices in both the day ahead and the real-time markets. This is also a chart that you've seen many times. So the dark blue is our existing authority that City Council has previously authorized. The yellow highlighted bar is what we have contracted for, and then the blue is what we are requesting today. You may note that there's always a little bit, um, we always request a little bit more than we think we will need, and that's to make sure that we have authority to pay for the energy info invoices to um, make sure we can pay for the energy that our customers utilize in both 2022 and the subsequent years. And then you can see in these later years, intentionally the portfolio is more open and we are bringing additional long-term contracts for council's consideration. So there'll be some recommendations next week at council on October 25th. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thanks, Lori. Let's go to the public first. Blair Beekman. Let's see if it parses the thing. Yes. You know, for the work that you did as a uh, city manager on the issues of, of reimagine and, and health and human services and natural disaster preparedness last year, and good luck in continuing those efforts into the next year. Uh, with that said, uh, thanks for the words of Council President Arenas in the last item too. Um, with that all said, uh, for this item, yeah, to include all those co concepts into our uh, renewable energy future, how we build the future of our community, uh, how it can be a community effort uh, to, to consider those concepts, like with your new, uh, municipal, new, new municipality ideas uh, in development. Uh, you actually were considering the public and municipal ideas. I, I can't thank you enough for that. I, I think just to be thinking of the public and the public's input to the process is so vital for the future of this work. It, it has to always be remembered. Uh, thank you for that. Good luck how, how to, if, as a person of the community, I hope you can really want to address the future of nuclear. And... Uh, I, I think, I hope we can learn to resolve issues with that. I mean, I'm learning that uh, we may have to rely on a bit of fossil fuel use uh, for the future of a real good renewable ideas at this time. But I'm, you know, in, in the Northern California really prepared how to um, uh, hold fossil fuel companies accountable in this process, which was just awesome of Northern California and the Bay Area and all of yourselves that I know you worked so hard to accomplish that, so thank you for that. And in the next few years, that hopefully can set a trend. I guess the idea is how to uh, 
move away from fossil fuels altogether in the renewable energy process. Good luck how that how we can do that. And I just hope we can talk openly about those concepts and make it clear and really learn to make it a full community effort and not just uh, a new bureaucracy created. Thank you. Victor Niemeyer. Hi, Vic Niemeyer, uh, resident energy economist, electricity economist. Uh, the procurement authority really increase of, is 60% uh, uh, this year, if you add what happened in March over what we started the year at. Uh, that's a lot of money, 720 billion, you know that. Uh, many of the circumstances justified in the memo uh, are really sort of transitory. Droughts come and go, we are unlucky. We can be unlucky a long time, I agree. Uh, gas prices and the futures curve are way down uh, starting in April this year. So, you know, I don't want sort of short-term things to just sort of spook us into such a large increase unless it's really needed. I can't tell what's really needed with anything that's in the public, but uh, we're really doubling down here. And it, it's at a bad time. Uh, in the future, the uh, Inflation Reduction Act is going to subsidize the daylights out of renewables. Uh, interest rates are at a, really up right now. Inflation is sort of a real unknown. We might be facing a recession. You know, all this to me says, you know, I really sort of get nervous about locking in things. You lock in, you get price certainty. That's a hedge. That's managing risk. But you're getting in return uh, a quantity uncertainty, a commodity risk is what we call it. And it's particularly awkward for some like San Jose where our customers can opt out. They're not gonna opt out right away, but you know, you can be surprised. You know, social media p uh, campaign sparked by uh, some you know, rate outrage. If we have a full 60% recovery is implied by these numbers over the next three years, that's a substantial uh, increase in our current rates. So uh, I would go slow as much as I could. I would suggest to the commission, or not the commission, the, the, the clean energy, uh, to go as slow as possible. Uh, you know, you hate to lock in at the top. Back to council. Thank you, and thanks to members of the public who came forward. Um, just to take the concern of the, the gentleman who just spoke, um, what you call commodity risk, certainly we all appreciate that. The risk of locking at the top. I, I saw some pretty ominous charts in the Wall Street Journal three days ago, uh, looking at um, all utility costs, gas, electric. Uh, it, none of it looked terribly good. I, I'm guessing, regardless of whatever wonderful things may happen in the world of renewables uh, and subsidies from the federal government, uh, it's the transmission uh, that gets really, really uh, more and more expensive uh, over time, particularly here in our area around PG&E. Is, is that fair to say? Lori, both transmission and distribution. Um, yes, we are expecting transmission and distribution to go up, but this authority is is to purchase power supply products right. um, and really short term. And I agree uh, with the speaker's comments in that you certainly do not want to lock in high power prices. Um, and so we monitor that very carefully. Um, at the same time, you know, it's important um, in the very, very short term for 2023 and even into 2024 that we've, you know, fixed our costs so that we have rate certainty and we're not exposed to additional high prices. It is somewhat unknown. I, I, I absolutely agree. We're at a very high point in the market and, you know, hopefully things will settle out. But unfortunately, it's impossible to exactly predict the future. So it's really important for us in the short term to have cost certainty. Um, I absolutely agree. Over the long term, we want to be very, very careful and monitor the market and you know take advantage of opportunities as things settle to lock in lower costs for our customers. And um can you just tell us a little bit about whatever specific actions we are taking to hedge the risk that we are coming into at, at, at exactly the high moment? Right. <clears throat> so for 2022, we are very well hedged. We're at the very high range of our coverage limits. Um, and so that has served us very well in 2022. As we all know, over Labor Day weekend, we had a very large heat wave and market prices were very high. 
Fortunately, the portfolio was not very exposed to that because we had procured energy ahead. And so that's what we intend to do for 2023 as well as 2024 while over that medium and that long term, um, leaving things open to take advantage of the market settling in the future. So what we're recommending today is um, a combination of adding additional authorities so that we can purchase for the short term in the next one to three years to make sure we have cost certainty. And then a little bit more authority in uh, years four and five so that we can also lock in some medium term. But again, we wanna be very cautious about that. That being said, this is for all products, not just energy. This is also resource adequacy. Um, renewable supply and carbon-free supply, um, those products are not, uh, you know, seeing the same, especially the renewable and the carbon-free are not seeing the same price increases. Resource adequacy is very high, um, but the main way we found to moderate that cost is to lock in, um, you know, several years in advance, so, you know, four- and five-year contracts, and so this authority allows us to do that. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Okay. Is there a motion? I'll go ahead and move approval. Second. All right, let's vote on Councilmember Mayhan's motion. Jimenez? Corrales? Corrales? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Carrasco? Roscoe? Davis? Yes. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Licardo? Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Item 6.2 is Climate Smart San Jose, our semi annual report. Welcome, Team Climate Smart, Julie and team. Good afternoon. My name is Julie Benavente. I'm the Deputy Director for Climate Smart Program in the Environmental Services Department, and I'm joined by Kate Ziemba from the Community Energy Department, as well as Ramses uh, Madow from the Department of Transportation. So uh, we'll be providing a SAMA annual update on the Climate Smart San Jose activities um, since our last, for our last reporting period, which was March through August. So as part of our core Climate Smart activities, staff continues to seek and acquire external resources to support Climate Smart initiatives. As you can see in this table, in fiscal year 21-22, the city acquired over $8 million in federal, state, and nonprofit resources. Um, during the current reporting period, the city received over $1.8 million in external resources and applied for an additional $600,000. Good afternoon, Kate Ziemba Community Energy Department. Some of the highlights were that two of our renewable energy projects came online and provide, now provide enough renewable energy to power more than 250,000 homes each year. And we have more solar, geothermal, and short and long duration storage projects being built over the next few years. Geothermal and long dura duration storage are key technologies as we transition to 100% carbon neutral energy as they help us meet demand peaks with renewable energy. We also launched two energy efficiency programs in September that will run through the end of 2024. The CPUC allocated public purpose program charges to San Jose Clean Energy to fully fund these programs. And the city council also allocated federal relief funds to expand access to the residential program. Through the residential program, we're offering 50 to 70% off high quality, high efficiency refrigerators, washers, and dryers. Customers can buy the appliances in person at Airport Home Appliance in San Jose. And they'll also get free delivery, installation, haul away, and a five year warranty. And this program also offers free smart thermostats and plug strips. And there are two groups that qualify for this program. 
The first is moderate income single family homes across the city and then any single family household in disadvantaged communities, which is defined by the CPUC. We also offer a commercial and schools program that is open to all businesses in San Jose, um, but we're targeting small and medium businesses like restaurants, convenience stores, and small offices. The program offers 80 to 90% rebates for HVAC, water heating, and refrigeration upgrades. And then finally, our solar access program offers low-income customers a 20% discount on their bill, and they receive 100% solar energy from an array in Merced. And that program is fully subscribed as of June 22, and we continue to maintain 100% participation, 100 participation every month. Continuing on, uh, we launched our California Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Project in 2020 with the California Energy Commission, and it provides 14 million for level two and direct current fast chargers in workplaces, public places, and apartments in San Jose. Installations will continue through 2024, but as of March, 52 level two and 11 direct current fast chargers are operational and nearly 40% of the chargers are being installed in low-income and disadvantaged communities. And then in November, we will bring a feasibility analysis for the direct current fast charging hubs pilot project for your consideration. And now I'll turn it over to Ramses. Afternoon, uh, Mayor and Council, Ramses Madhu, uh, Department of Transportation. Um, uh, as you know, uh, we were able to bring some pretty significant policy and planning um, uh, efforts uh, to you uh, over the last reporting period. Um, we uh, were directed by Council uh, to bring forward a parking and transportation demand management ordinance update, um, which we're working hard to finalize right now and get to before the end of the year. Um, uh, that will remove all parking amounts throughout the city um, and, uh, and increase or uh, amend our transportation demand management requirements for new development. We also uh, brought forward the citywide transportation plan, the Move San Jose plan, uh, which aligns our uh, prioritization and usage of resources around transportation um, to meet uh, environmental uh, as well as equity and safety goals. Um, and uh, lastly, uh, we also brought forward the transit first policy, um, which uh, directs staff within DOT um, to uh, to prioritize transit um, in the places where transit uh, is running the most. With that, I'll pass it back. With the new California Building Code cycle, staff is bringing an updated reach code ordinance to council to continue existing reach code components and expects to bring an additional update in December based on previous council direction. On the natural gas infrastructure prohibition ordinance that's currently in place, staff noted that there were no known exemptions requested or granted for natural gas fuel cell installations under the existing distributed energy resources exemption option. Um, since the memo was posted, staff has received updated information um, in terms of the number of installs of the fuel cells um, that fall, would fall under this DER exemption. Um, those are at least uh, 60 installs representing 50 megawatts of capacity in San Jose. This also equates to approximately 2% of citywide emissions based on our last inventory. And... Um, that is also approximately the same as the amount of our city operations emissions in terms of percentage for our inventory. Um, this is significant just in the light of the city's um, carbon neutrality goals. So staff will be returning to council with more substantive update on this exemption no later than December 2023 uh, prior to the exemption expiration date uh, per the direction in the ordinance. And with that, um, just letting you know that we have a lot more coming forward in the next reporting period. And um, there, we also have several city council items um, listed on here in the next couple of months. And we'll just open for questions. Great, thank you, Joy. Thanks everybody. 
Uh, let's go to the public first. Susan Butler Graham, followed by, I think it's Linda. I'll just come on down to the microphone. First person um, to the microphone, state your name. Hi, my name is Susan Butler Graham. I am a resident of San Jose. And I wish to thank you so much for your efforts to achieve the goals of the Climate Smart San Jose plan. Um, and I urge you to do more. Specifically, please move swiftly to sunset the exemption that allows gas powered distributed energy resources in new construction. This issue is really important to me because I really, really want us to meet our 2030 goals. Um, so I'm gonna show you a visual are um, a backup. We know we don't like diesel, right? But as it stands, if a company uses, if a building uses diesel backup generators for the days that the power is out, then this is how much, this is how much greenhouse gas emissions they produce. If you use the fuel cells, the gas, the gas powered fuel cells, I will show you how much, how you can compare that. They run 365, 24 hours a day. They, they produce way more greenhouse gas emissions. So, next. 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 And. Too much. They pollute so much more. And if we keep on building, we, if we have 60 now, and in the next few years we approve a number more and they're bigger, we will not reach our 2030 goals. And I urge you, for the sake of our children and our grandchildren, please, please sunset this exemption early. We would like it to sunset the end of 2022. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Hi, I'm Linda Hutchins Knowles, San Jose resident, co founder of Mothers Out Front Silicon Valley. I also want to thank staff and council for your leadership on climate. You've done some tremendous work in the past six years that we've been advocating. And this feels like one of the decision points. Will you stand with your decision and your leadership on carbon neutrality? Or will you give a special favor and continue it for one company? I know that the exemption was written with neutral language. So it doesn't look like it's for one company. But we all know that it was. That company has a lot more money, a lot more influence than we do. But we have the people. We sent a letter signed by 17 organizations, 80 individuals, a petition that has 222, but I forgot to print that out and bring that in. But this is really important. And we know that there's talk about we have to be fair to the company and let them have their say. Yes, but would you say to Exxon, um, we have to let you have your say. This is a fossil fuel company. And if the facts are what we're saying, and we believe they are, then how would you allow this to continue? I want to point out that the exemption is not needed. There's a hardship exemption that was really wisely written. In fact, it's almost the same language as the DER exemption. If you look at it, it mentions public health and safety. You could actually direct the staff to end the DER exemption whenever you want. You have that power. You did it immediately when it was proposed, you could immediately do it to close it. And the hardship exemption is there. And if a company needs it, and there's no other way to get their backup power, then the city has the power to say yes. Right now, they don't have the power to say no. So if some other kind of DER comes in, that's not a fuel cell, that's even worse. The city has to say, yes, we're sorry, that's the way the code is. Their hands are tied. So we mothers and children and kids and all the allies are asking you, to have the courage to do the right thing, we need to stop building out new fossil gas infrastructure 
we need to turn off the tap, as Greta Thunberg wrote. I hope you will read the article I sent. She wrote, it's so powerful. And we will not be greenwashed. Thank you. Thank you. Dashiell yeah, Lee. Hello, my name is Dashiell Leeds. I'm the conservation organizer for the Sierra Club Lumber Prieta chapter, and I'm a District 1 resident. We're in strong support of San Jose's efforts to achieve carbon neutrality by 2030. And the city has made strong commitments to decarbonize buildings and transition away from existing fossil gas pipeline infrastructure. But currently, the door is wide open for fossil fuel companies to install on-site gas power plants, plants that operate 24 hours a day, 365 days a year on methane gas gas power plants that circumvent San Jose clean energy and significantly set us back on climate change. Power plants that rely on the constant and future operation of the very same gas pipeline network that the city has committed publicly to transition away from. So please, uh, I agree with all of Linda's comments, please sunset this DER exemption. And if you do, worst case scenario, these fossil fuel companies still have the opportunity to apply for a hardship exemption from the city. But at least this way, it puts the burden of proof on the gas applicant and allows city staff to block unnecessary gas power plants that contradict our climate smart goals. Please give our city the power to say no to new fossil fuel pipelines and gas power plants. Thank you. Mila? Hi, my name is Mila Bacala, and I am a District 3 San Jose resident, a high school student, and a member of Silicon Valley Youth Climate Action. I am here today to urge the city to finally eliminate the DER exemption clause. San Jose took a huge step forward for the future of our city and our planet by banning gas infrastructure in new buildings. But an unfair carve out for distributed energy resources tarnishes that accomplishment because every single DER unit results in greenhouse gas emissions equivalent to several hundred gas-powered buildings. These units also have to report to the EPA for the hazardous carcinogens they produce. DER companies should not be making money off of emitting the very greenhouse gases that are endangering our future. That's the reason our city passed this groundbreaking legislation in the first place, and special interests shouldn't play by different rules. We need our city to stand strong for a gas-free future for the health of our planet and the health of our lungs. Sunsetting the DER exemption clause will show our city's commitment to the future of young people like me, rather than to a special interest corporation trying to make a profit off of a warming planet. Please make the right choice. Thank you. Ronnie? Hello, my name is Mani Bikela and I am an eighth grader and a member of Silicon Valley Youth Climate Action. I request that this council works to remove the damaging distributed energy resources or DER exemption to the citywide ban on natural gas in new buildings with haste. Bloom Energy, a maker of natural gas fuel cells and the exemption's main beneficiary has justified the clause for three primary reasons and all lack a foundation. Firstly, they say that the original ban will harm their business. A separate exemption in the original ban allows companies to install gas in new buildings if they can prove they cannot do otherwise due to financial constraint, and Bloom is free to apply and prove its case. Next, they argue that the electricity grid will be vulnerable without gas power. Renewable energy is already supplying reliable backup power to many institutions. In fact, natural gas is more vulnerable than electricity after earthquakes and other natural disasters and Bloom's fuel cells require flowing natural gas. If necessary, even diesel backup generators have lower emissions due to only running when there is a power outage. Finally, Bloom states that in the future, it will use its natural gas infrastructure to transition to green hydrogen fuel. However, numerous studies have proven that natural gas pipelines are unable to transport hydrogen fuel without leaking it out. If they do suddenly discover a way to transition to hydrogen, Bloom Energy can do so entirely unaffected by the natural gas ban. This exemption simply allows a special interest corporation to get out of its legal and community obligations. Restoring the full ban on natural gas infrastructure in such a large and influential city will set a precedent for implementing new legislation and solutions to fight climate change across this region and our country and provide hope for my generation's future. Thank you. Brian. 
Hi, uh, this is Leanne Trung. Uh, the DR exemption allows egregious amounts of GHG emissions many more times than the emissions from using um, SJCE uh, CE with the diesel as backup power. The, large, the uh, longer the exemption is in place, the more likely these emissions will multiply. Fortunately, there are more affordable and sustainable solutions for businesses that needing under, in a, under, interrupted power, including solar with battery storage. Sunsetting the DR exemption will not harm the small businesses of San Jose. Fuel solids are extremely expensive and used on enterprise scale by companies that should have to follow the same rules as the rest of us. The fact that the exemption is vaguely worded as DER means that it is a CO2 wolf in fuel cell clothing, allowing other, even more climate destabilizing energy sources powered by fossil gas. We are concerned that Google could apply to use uh, gas powered fuel cells or other gas powered fuel energy systems um, at at its very large new downtown campus, which would lock in enormous amounts of methane gas for years. My worry is that other large corporations will follow Google's example. My worry is that other cities across Silicon Valley, the Bay Area and the nation, will follow the city of San Jose's example and replicate this misguided exemption. And we will blow past any possibility of carbon neutrality by 2030. Our very water is drying up from this terrible drought. This is already beginning to de devastate our Central Valley, the breadbasket of the world, which we also depend on. We cannot afford for the climate crisis to grow worse. Please sunset the DR exemption with all due haste by December 30th. Claire? Uh, thank you, Leanne. Um, I guess, you know, just to first off, uh, good luck how we can really be open to the creative ideas of solar and uh, really consider how to harness the energy from space itself and to have those open creative conversations uh, can be a lot of help for ourselves, I think. With that all said, uh, to approach this item a little bit differently, uh, I, I, to again offer, I, I feel that we really have to have important conversations about a climate smart future that in, really includes the concepts of worker rights issues. And we, for all the climate work we do, we have to consider, you know, equity and, and worker rights uh, for, say, people in, in, in the many countries that will be mining the rare earth minerals. And it's with those sort of good efforts at, at, at good jobs and good human rights practices that I think we can stave off, you know, what may be a future of skirmishes and war in different parts of the world that is very possible that's going to take place if, if, if we don't work on good human rights and worker rights issues with the rare earth mineral ideas or needs, I guess. Um, with that said, uh, good luck how, you know, the, down in downtown, the Big Belly, I mean, that has, uh, I think, seismic uh, uh, reading equipment, you know, to get ready for the uh, upcoming BART. So to, to make uh, open public policy uh, practices with the climate smart technology can be a great beginning example how to make the whole process for a community more easy and accessible and understandable and, and the community can ask questions. And that can be a good way to introduce the community how to ask questions about their climate smart uh, technology uh, data collection. So overall, uh, good luck on how we talk about these issues. Thank you. Olivia. Hi, thank you. Um, good afternoon, Mary Licardo and council members. Uh, I'm Olivia Walker with NRDC, the Natural Resources Defense Council. I'm here first, thank you for your continued efforts to achieve the goals set forth in the Climate Smart San Jose plan. And second, like the speakers before me, I'm uh, here to urge you to sunset the Natural Gas Infrastructure Prohibition Ordinances exemption for uh, gas-powered distributed energy resources, or DERs, in order to end a gaping loophole in the policy and truly take San Jose into the all-electric future. NRDC staff, including myself, had the immense pleasure of working directly with the city both on the 2019 REACH Code and the 2020 Gas, gas Infrastructure Prohibition Ordinance. And today, two years later, the case for the gas prohibition ordinance is just as strong, if not stronger. 
but the DER exemption allows for gas-powered fuel cells that continue local demand for new natural gas infrastructure, which is directly antithetical to the spirit of the original ordinance. This corporate-backed loophole allows for the unfettered use of fuel cells powered by natural gas. What's more, as others have mentioned, it's redundant with a hardship exemption, which is itself would ensure that truly needed DER installations would be permitted if well justified. I personally believe this exemption to be profit driven and counterproductive to climate smart San Jose's goals, but at the very best, it's simply unnecessary. Uh, I urge you to strengthen San Jose's climate leadership and sunset the exemption as soon as possible. Thank you for your time. Moria? There we go, okay. Good afternoon, Mayor Licardo and Council. I'm Moria Merriweather and I'm a member of my mother's out front, Silicon Valley. I've lived in City Council District 7 for over 30 years. As you may have noticed, Mother's Out Front is here today speaking to let you know how very important it is that you remove the unnecessary exemption in the gas ban ordinance as soon as possible. I'm speaking to just one of the many reasons why this is urgent. The distributed energy resource exemption is written so vaguely that it allows energy systems that are even more climate destabilizing than fuel cells are. While the intention behind the exemption was specifically to allow for fuel cells, the language of distributed energy resources has opened the door to other types of gas-powered DER. As an example, Microsoft recently requested and received permission under the exemption to use renewable, renewable natural gas to power its emergency backup generators. And given the DER exemption, the staff had no choice but to approve this project, even though rates of methane leakage from gas pipelines are very high and are a key driver of climate change. Fortunately, Microsoft only plans to use this for their backup power. However, if the exemption is left in place, we risk even larger facilities opting to use climate destabilizing methane gas for their continuous base load power. There is no limit to the number of exemptions that could be granted, which could go far beyond what the council intended when it approved this exemption. Please consider this and please uh, consider uh, removing the exemption as soon as possible. Thank you for your support of climate stabilization efforts and for hearing my comments today. Jenny Green. Hi, my name is Jenny Green, and I'm a resident of San Jose and a member of Mothers Out Front. And as some of the other speakers have mentioned, the city's ban on gas in new buildings has an exemption for gas power for distributed energy resources, including gas-powered fuel cells. I want to join the other speakers in asking you to please sunset the exemption as soon as possible. And one thing I think that none of the other commenters have mentioned yet is that due to technological advances in the two years since the exemption was originally granted, there are now many examples of mission critical facilities using renewable energy, such as solar power with battery backup for all their backup power needs. I think Mothers Out Front sent all the council members a letter that includes links to several examples, so I won't go into too much detail, but I'll just mention a couple. Um, the San Benito Health Foundation in Hollister now has the ability to rely entirely on solar energy and battery backup for at least a week. And also the Redwood Coast Airport is now uh, running off a microgrid that includes a solar photovoltaic array and a battery energy storage system. So those are just two examples of large mission critical facilities that are using state-of-the-art solar and battery backup. So this is no longer an emerging technology, it has arrived. And gas-powered fuel cells are not necessary um, for companies to, um, to use as backup power. So I hope that you'll sunset the exemption as soon as possible. Thanks. All right, Amanda. Hello and good afternoon. My name is Amanda Bancroft and I'm a San Jose resident and also on the board of directors for the Silicon Valley Youth Climate Action Organization. I'm requesting that you sunset the DER exemption of the natural gas ban. All of the already installed fuel cells that we have in the city is accounting for two to three percent of our city's emissions. And if that's not alarming enough, then the fact that natural gas, which the fuel cells are running 24-7 on, 
is highly inefficient and leaks methane throughout the entire distribution process. That should cause you to worry a bit. Climate change is calling for real solutions that aren't based on polluting sources and fragile infrastructure that may become compromised with the increasing natural disasters. Well, luckily for us, that technology of reliable, clean, and safe energy distribution and storage exists. So let's get with the times and start by sunsetting this exemption and all the harmful pollutants that come with it. Thank you for taking the time to hear my comment today. Hello there, my name is Crystal Hernandez. I'm with Octera's ASAP program, and I fully support electrification and uh, reach codes that are being implemented um, and for us to reach further um, if we can. Um, I believe your council is doing a great job in um, providing this presentation for us today, and I hope that we can do a better job moving forward. I second all the speakers before me, and I support um, what they've said. Thank you. Back to the council. Okay, back to the council. Councilmember Member Cohen. Uh, yeah, thank you, and thank you for the report and all the work that we're doing. Um, I'm really proud of the work that San Jose is doing to get us to uh, uh, climate to our climate goals for 2030, and also on all the transportation work we're doing that are part of that. Getting people into bikes, out of cars, and all of the all of the things that are coming uh, are are we're pushing pretty hard. And I know it's a lot of staff work too to get us <laughs> to to make sure we prioritize the things with the biggest uh, impact to get us to our goals. Um, I just want to ask a few questions. Obviously, we've heard a lot of comments about fuel cells, so I'm going to just ask some questions on the topic. The, the slide in your presentation, I'm, I don't know if you can go back to it, but the slide that talked about the number of, of installations uh, since 2021 um, said there haven't been any under this exemption, but then said there's new information, or did it say that there's, there were about 20, there were 20 that happened and they all occurred prior to the, they were all approved prior to the exemption, is that right? Yeah, sorry, just to <clears throat> clarify. So um, that's correct that there have not, oh, that's correct that there have not been um, any exemptions that staff has reviewed and approved for fuel cells under the DER exemption since the exemption went into place in August, 2021. The update was on the second bullet there about the 20 installations that um, we understand. So we were using available data that we had access to and we understand um, that uh, there's at least more like 60 um, installations oh, with representing 50 megawatts of capacity. That's so the 20 was an old number, now you know yeah, there's the 50. Yeah, the 20 and the 30. And all, and all 60 were Those are prior to the exempt, to the uh, natural gas yes. ban and the exemption. That's correct. And you said that they were, there were none have been approved through the exemption. When you say approved through exemption, what's the process? Because, you know, I mean, there's this idea that, that uh, the exemption is automatic and people can do it, but what process do people have to go through? Um, so, so based on the ordinance, it does require that we approve if it meets the, you know, what's laid out in the ordinance in terms of definitions. Um, but we have put in place an exemption uh, process requiring that people who want to get the exemption uh, fill out a form that we've added some additional data um, points in there so that we can make sure to track very closely because we knew that we were coming back to council before the end of next calendar year to be able to report back. So it just allowed us to do more of a tracking and also to be able to have um, both the environmental services department as well as planning building code enforcement have a look at you know what was coming through. So we do have a process in place, um, but you know we wouldn't be able to deny, I guess, an exemption if, right. you know, if it meets the criteria. <clears throat> and, and there haven't been any applications filed so, uh, in the last year in San Jose? There have not been any applications for fuel cells under the DER exemption. There was, as mentioned by a previous speaker, there was, um, there is at least one exemption that was under, for the DER, uh, but it was for uh, the biogas 
backup generation for the Microsoft oh, right. project. Right, okay, yeah. yeah, I mean, that's, and I mean, there's, there's other things that, you know, we didn't, obviously I wasn't on council at the time, I can't say how necessarily, <laughs> Uh, you know, I don't know necessarily how I would have come down on this exemption at the time because I wasn't here to, to go to hear all of the uh, input. You know, one of our issues was that the reason this happened is that, you know, there were there were at least one company who said, well, th th this is happening and we're feel blindsided by it. We didn't have a process. Um, so certainly we need a process um, going forward to make sure that at least whatever we do to change it is going to be clear to people before we make a change to the to the rules. Um, the, what is, what though is the, under the hardship exemption, let me just say this, under the hardship exemption, presumably there would be a, an avenue by which somebody could install one of these fuel cell DERs, um, but it seems less likely because we would be able to say to them, there are alternatives that you could use to this system that we would then approve and that we would let you use, that you could use, that there's no, it's hard to come up with a hardship that says this is the only technology available to you. Is that correct? Or m maybe you don't know the answer to that, but I'm just. <laughs> I, I was wondering if legal wanted to, I mean, because I, I imagine, you know, it just based on how the language is laid out in that exemption, um, <clears throat> It is, I think it's a little bit broadly laid out, but I mean, it would be depend on what came right. forward exactly in the, you know. Well, yeah, I mean, I mean if the, maybe there's a way somebody could come up with an explanation as to why this is the only technology they could use, but it's, it's hard for me to imagine because, for example, you know, we've used the argument that if we want to have server business in the city, we have to offer, because that's a big business and a lot of growth, and Santa Clara and other cities around us are dominating in that field, and we want some of them here, but we know Microsoft is building a, uh, server farm in, in District 4, and they've decided that diesel backup is just as good for them as, the, as any other solution. They don't need it, so it's pretty hard for me to come up with a scenario by which one would get the hardship exemption specifically for this kind of technology. Anyway, I'll just leave it at that. Um, I think we need, we need, um, I, I'm, I'm glad to hear that we're bringing back a discussion in 2023 to have this, to, to and I think part of that discussion is not just a report, but a recommendation, right, of what we want to do as far as That's the timing correct. of the sunset? That's correct. We would bring, bring back a recommendation uh, after the analysis. Is there a reason why we, is there some reason why you would suggest we should wait till the end of 2023 to have that conversation? Well, we'd like to follow council direction, um, and the rationale for the timing was to allow for us to do the full evaluation, bring back to you an assessment based on enough time having passed to do that evaluation, and then give enough lead time to the building industry and developers to be able to make choices before we changed the timing. We obviously can respond to changes in direction on that, but I want to make sure that we have sufficient timing and resources for staff both to do the work and then uh, for us to give enough of a lead time to the building industry to take that into consideration as they might need to change their plans. So those were the two uh, kind of guide rail rationales in addition to, of course, following council direction. Kip Harkness, Deputy City Manager. Okay. Um, I mean, so the only, and I guess what you're saying is you probably need a motion for direction to change if it's sooner than the, that because the, 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 the exemption itself had a date of, of end of 2023 for bringing that back, is that correct? Correct, we had clear council direction on when to bring back the uh, update on the exemption and staff's recommendations based on the analysis that they would do prior to that. Okay. Um, so I would like to suggest that we have that conversation sooner next year and not necessarily, um, you know, but, I mean, obviously this depends on, on what we think staff time is. One of the, you know, how we think st this will affect staff's overall balance of the important work that's being done to reach these goals overall. Um, we do need to have that outreach process with those who are affected. But given that we've had no applications in a year and a half, I think it's somewhat safe to say that the building industry isn't necessarily um, you know, going to be hamstrung by a, sh a shortening of this time period. Well, there are some businesses who might be, in theory, affected by it. Um, so what, I mean, what is your feeling about staff time as far as being able to 
bring a report on this back sooner than in the 2023. Well, with something like that, typically, um, generally, this would be brought forward at Rules Committee or, or another uh, process, because this, this item is just an update. So we have not had a chance to do what we would normally do, which is a, an evaluation of, of whether we can do that within the existing capacity or whether that would knock other priorities around. So I'd be uh, getting ahead of myself to suggest um, what the implications would be on changing the timing without having had a chance to to work that through with Make, staff, but sense. would be happy to come back to this future council direction and do that analysis. Okay, makes sense. Rules committee with an early consideration form about staff requirements, and then we and then we take it from there. So exactly, yeah, that would be that would be our preferred path, and we'd be able to give you a good analysis and thoughtful analysis at that point on whether it's either easy or hard or, or, or somewhere in between, and you can make the policy call at that point. Okay, well, I'll make a motion to accept the report, and then we'll uh, figure out the next step after that one. Thank you. Second. Uh, motion from Councilmember Cohen, second from Councilmember Mahan. Uh, Councilmember Foley. Great, thank you for the presentation, and I'm uh, particularly proud of the efforts on our transportation model to reduce greenhouse gases, both move San Jose, parking amendments, and the transit first policies are really important because transportation is one of the biggest contributors to greenhouse gases, as we know. Uh, I'm, I'm glad to see that we're looking at freight transportation as a key area to reduce transportation emissions as well. Um, unfortunately, we've kind of forgotten that transportation or that, that freight is a big deal and that is contributing, but the studies that we're seeing in the analysis, we know that that is contributing tremendously to our greenhouse gases. Um, so I have a couple of questions, uh, and I, I do appreciate the update, and I also appreciate the conversations around the uh, fuel cells and the exemptions and look forward to that coming back to us. Uh, but in the memorandum, I saw that there's about 2,000, is, I guess this is, one of you will answer this question, I'm sure. 2,000 customers enrolled in the total green product but I didn't see anything for green value. Is there a number of customers who have enrolled in green value? Is Lori around? I didn't see, there she is. So the, the question is in the number of uh, folks in, enrolled in the green value. Yeah, versus, yeah, we have, to, we, there was a number for the total green, but there wasn't for green value. I'm just curious as to the success of that program. Thank you, Council Member Lori Mitchell, Director of Community Energy. So Green Value is our lowest cost um, program, so it's priced the same as PG&E. Um, we've had some movement into that, but fairly low. It's about 3% uh, of our customer base. Um, I don't recall the total number of customers, but we can get you that information. Um, we do think it's been a successful program, though, in retaining customers and just um, making sure that our customers know that they have choices. Um, you know, both the green source, which is uh, priced at a premium, but 60% renewable, and green value, which is more cost competitive. Okay. Thank you. Would it benefit us to try and get more customers in the green valley to stay within green valley? A valley. Green value. So we always offer that to our customers um, when they call in and... Um, you know, whether they're asking to opt out or just wanting to understand what their customer choices are, we always um, make sure that they understand uh, that product and, and that that's available to them. Um, but I also want to note that we will bring forward to council recommendations on both green source and green value and rate change adjustments. And um, we hope to have a green source also less expensive um, than PG&E. Um, next year in 2023. Great. So that will come to council for consideration in December. Wonderful, thank you. Next question I have is about the Inflation Reduction Act that has opened up some dollars for electrification and climate resiliency. When might we see some of that money and how much do you think we might see and where might we be able to utilize it? Excellent question, Council Member Kip Harkness, Deputy City Manager. Um, 
we are looking at both the Inflation Reduction Act and the uh, Infrastructure Investment Jobs Act, as well as the state funding that's being made available. There really is an unprecedented amount, to your point, of uh, funding available for both clean energy and uh, resilient infrastructure. So working with Zane Barnes and the Intergovernmental Relations team, as well as other folks uh, across departments, we are uh, mounting an aggressive campaign to try to get as much of that money as possible. A lot of it is uh, allocated in uh, processes which require us to compete mm -hmm. and emphasize uh, collaboration, equity goals in that competition. So we estimate that over the next three to five years, there is at least a billion dollars or more that's on the table that we would be competitive for if we can put the applications in and pull them down. So putting together strong teams, be, getting out aggressive, aggressively in front of those opportunities, and then uh, being good partners and focusing on some of the equity issues will require a, a sustained level of effort over the next several years to do that. And while we've got a small team working on that, uh, just sort of my sense is we're gonna need to pull more resources into that to be competitive. The good news is any resources that get pulled into that should pay for themselves uh, 10 times over or more. Um, some of those notices are coming out now and we're actively working with the departments in a cross-departmental effort to not only make them aware, but to try and prioritize and support them where we can to move forward on, on going after those funds. That's great. So you're working on building your team now for when the opportunities are there and and we can jump on them. Yes, and the opportunity is already coming. So we're, we're, we're trying to jump on them as they come and with the help of our folks in the uh, legislative community also get a, the opportunity to influence some of the rules that are being made around them so they don't cut us out of uh, the competent, competitive process. Wonderful, thank you very much. And, and the last uh, question is that we're doing a lot of things to reduce emissions, but do we have any read on statistically what we're seeing. Are we seeing any real benefit from some of the, th some of the changes we're making, it, both in the city and then recommendations uh, around electrification and that sort of thing? Are we doing, is there any, how close, well, we're not, we haven't reached our goal yet, but are we making progress to reach our goal? Yeah, so um, our team does inventories, both community-wide and municipal operations inventories on alternating years. So this year is a municipal inventory, but we're actually probably gonna be doing them pretty close together um, um, and, compete, and completing those. So we'll have another look, um, but in the, based on the previous inventories, we are making progress and significant progress actually surpassing our goals based on the the goal lines that we have you know going to um the, the ultimate 2030 uh, 2050 originally and then you know 2030. and when we bring you the integrated resource plan to council i think next week or soon i've, I've lost track of the exact date that will go into uh, some great detail on specifically the energy wholesale side and how we are tracking toward and what our plans are to meet the 2030 uh, uh, carbon free goal um, and sort of to give an initial preview of that, the staff has put together an aggressive plan to, to meet that goal, and we think that it's within reach and feasible. Thank you. I want to thank you for your report. The, there is, uh, this is one of the most important things that we're involved in in the city in preserving and protecting our environment for our future, our children, and we heard several of the uh, youth, uh, environmental youth children, children, you speakers coming in and calling in and telling us how important this is. And we know it is important to our future and to our present. So I thank you for the, the effort so far and look forward to more, more progress. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Mayhead. Thanks, Mayor. Thank you so much for the report and, and all the work you all are doing. I really appreciate it. I was hoping we could just take a couple of minutes to talk a little more about the EV, EV charging infrastructure and adoption. I was hoping to see more data in the report, but I also realize it looks like it's pretty recent that we've had those, what is it, 63 chargers that are operational. That's since March of this year. And I was just curious, if there's anything we're learning about utilization rates, and if you can tell us maybe more broadly, um, and I apologize, I should have prepped you for this, but what the research tells us about our investment in those stations versus consumer adoption of EVs. And, and just curious to talk a little more about this part of our strategy. Sure, thank you, council member. Um, so, so far, like you said, 63 stations have gone in as a result of the Cali VIP project. 
um, representing about 1 million of the 14 million spend. So we do expect um, a lot more stations to come in the next years. And so, so far, um, we don't have too many insights to report, um, you know, with the pandemic and supply chain issues, as well as uh, pg and &E service planning and even permitting, there have been many obstacles to getting the chargers installed. And so we really expect this to pick up in the coming year. Um, we are tracking EV adoption and um, in Q2 of this year, 30, nearly 30% 30 of new cars registered in San Jose were electric. So we're definitely leaders among the nation. That's great to hear. Awesome. It, can you give us a sense of, so, so you, you've been able to deploy one out of 14 million roughly. As you spend the rest, what's the timeline given what you're seeing with supply chains? Um, we think that most of the stations can be in by 2024, maybe latest 2025. Um, you know, for example, for direct current fast charging stations, it takes about a year to a year and a half for a project to be installed. So those have the longest timelines. Okay. And um, we are seeing, we are going to see a lot more of those projects start very soon. Okay, great. And then are we, how are we deciding between level two versus fast charging and what do, assume consumers prefer fast charging, but what are the considerations there? Um, so the initial allocation was decided by the CEC between level two and fast charging. But currently um, there is a gap for many programs for there's available capacity in level two funding that jurisdictions are switching over to D DC fast charging um, because there's more demand on the developer side for those right for okay. that technology. That's that's what I would think. Okay, cool. And um, I assume the research shows that the more that we make this investment, we're helping to facilitate adoption. Is that fair to say? Um, yes. And you know, there's billions more coming in state and federal funding as well. Yeah, that's great. And then finally, you talked about the um, the equitable distribution of them. Can you just tell us again what the what the distribution looks like and how you're deciding that? Yeah. So so far, 40% of the chargers are being installed in low income and disadvantaged communities. Right. Are those mostly um, multifamily, or are they out? Um, it's a accessible mix. to everyone. It's a mix. Um, so for the Cali VIP project for multifamily, they don't necessarily have to be accessible to the public, but all other um, type, all other locations must be accessible to the public. Got it. Okay, great. Well, I'm I'm so excited about that strategy because it seems to me, and you're the experts, but um, you know, one of the barriers to scaling solar, obviously, is is that intermittency issue and it feels like EVs are one of those places where we can scale up short-term storage and, and shift that supply from midday to the when the demand is high in the evening so I think it's I think it's an exciting part of the strategy and hope to learn more as you come back when will we get another update on just the charging and EV adoption piece of this we are coming back with on, on November 15th with our direct current fast charging hubs pilot program and that will include some background on um, EV charging and that shift to shifting charge more charging to the middle of the day. Okay, cool. But but probably not utilization rates yet, right? Of the chargers that are out there. Um, no, not yet. Um, okay. That's that next may year. take some time. Yeah. Yes. Okay. All right. Thanks again. Thank you. Uh, just going online here to see if any of my colleagues have questions. If not, I'll jump in with mine. I appreciate where Councilmember Mahan left off because I really think we're thinking about reducing greenhouse gas emissions in this city. Um, the lowest hanging fruit right now is around electric vehicles. If we think about at least when we originally came out with our climate plan, I think it was 63% of our emissions were coming from transportation. Is that still what we believe or is that number come down? Uh, the latest um, uh, accounting put us more around 52, if I remember the exact number. Yeah, I remember um, seeing that, and I was kind of scratching my head how we went from such a high number to 52. It was, it's still a lot. <laughs> but yeah. yeah, it went down. We can go through the methodology um, if you want to offline, but um, okay. Yeah, but it wasn't anything we did. It was the methodology that changed. It was mostly the methodology that changed. Yeah. Us. Okay. In any event, still majority of our emissions, and um, gosh, we drive a lot. So, <laughs> and we're all trying to build BART as fast as we can and everything else, but in the meantime, we're still gonna drive a lot. 
so it seems to me this EV stuff is really, really important. Um, one concern I had, Kate, was about the expiration of the Cal VIP program, which I thought was the end of 2023. So I guess my question is, are we actually gonna use all those rebates that were made available or are we gonna leave money on the table? Thank you, Mayor Licardo. 2023 is the expiration of our contract with the program implementer, Center for Sustainable Energy. Okay. Um, but the implementer in their contract with the California Energy Commission, they have to continue to implement the project until funds are exhausted. So okay. we would just need to- So we're uh, not gonna lose the money? No. Okay, I'm in. That's what I want to hear. <laughs> um, nonetheless, we'd all like to get them deployed a lot faster. Um, my office and I have had some in-depth engagement on some of the challenges of getting some of these uh, chargers deployed. Um, can you give us sort of a top three <laughs> of what the problems are that are really slowing down deployment? Um, so what we're hearing is supply chain issues. It's still taking, you know, a year or more to order the actual electric vehicle charging equipment. PG&E service planning, mm -hmm. um, especially for direct current fast charging infrastructure that can take 12 to 18 months yeah. to get in that pipeline. Um, and then uh, to another extent, permitting, but which is something we need to investigate more. But these are just um, what we hear anecdotally from the applicants in the Cali VIP project. Okay. And I'll add, uh, sorry, Ramses from DOT, that the cost of DC fast charging is, is, is just very high. Right, I mean, this is, this is a, a substantial um, investment, which means you're having to um, install upline um, uh, uh, pieces of equipment um, to actually bring the service into the, into the site. And you actually need to reinforce whatever power, or expand the amount of power load that's- That's right. Reserved. Okay, so there's a lot more infrastructure to it than just a, a little stand. Okay, I got it. Um, well, I appreciate that. And if, to the extent that the problem is permitting <laughs> i'm hoping that in some way that's prioritized within our work plan over in pvc side um given that i guess the fact that, that this is so aligned with so many of our goals um and i know i'm looking at the wrong team here to answer that question but is there anybody there is no wrong team. Okay. Um, I think that's a good question, and, and we'll take that. Um, we certainly know that uh, streamlining uh, new processes and building permits is important on all sorts of things, and we will take a look at this as part of the work okay. plan going forward in collaboration with our partners in PBCE and building to make sure that we've got a clear, easy path forward for these types of developments. Thanks, Kip, because I know we got more than 40 processes now that you can get a permit online in a day, and boy, it wouldn't be nice if this is one of them. Okay. Um, the... The, um, speaking on, on the same theme on long electric vehicles, um, I saw on page four, <clears throat> there's the discussion of the partnership of Evolution, First Community Housing and Silicon Valley Bike Coalition uh, to co-develop e-mobility programs and services. And I know that's not just cars, but other stuff too. Um, and it seems to me that the really challenging part of this and the really important part is trying to figure out how we can help make a market, um, that is, there's something that families can pay um, on a tight budget for the mobility if they're not having to pay the cost of, the enormous cost of having a car, and I know that's a very big ask for a lot of folks to give that up. Um, and I'm just wondering to what extent, in all this, sort of community outreach and so forth, we're really doing sort of the harder market research of trying to understand, hey, is an electric car sharing service, is that viable here? If so, what's the price point? How can we scale it? How can we get more people part of it? Because I think about all the problems that could be solved, and we see this a lot in Europe. A lot of European communities have very extensive electric car sharing um, clusters and communities, and it works very, very well. And it solves a lot of problems around parking, which Lord knows we have, particularly in many of the modest income families, uh, or modest income neighborhoods, uh, like in downtown East San Jose and around where I live in other places, there's just no parking. And this would be a fantastic solution. In addition to all the other challenges that we're trying to uh, help families overcome and, and the cost of mobility. And so I guess the question is, to what extent are we also engaging that sort of hard research that could help us bring partners in to create a solution? Uh, great question, Mayor. Um, so 
we're tackling this from multiple sides, right? One is, is do people even want this, period, right? yeah. without the kind of harder numbers? And you know, through the Emerging Mobility Action Plan outreach, um, and uh, we got a lot of feedback that folks would like to see these kinds of services. But most of them feel like these kinds of services are not meant for them if they're not um, higher income, right? They feel like these kinds of services cost more uh, than they can really afford. I don't know if you followed the, the price increases on the, uh, the electric scooters, um, but they've shot up from, you know, parsley amounts to costing, you know, $5 just to get across from, you know, downtown to Japantown at this point. Yeah. Right. And so the harder market research is being done now uh, with some of the companies, right? So we're, we're talking to some of these companies, would you want to come do this? How would you do this? And just like a lot of these systems and probably a lot of the, the shared micromobility systems, subsidy is something we're going to probably have to talk about yeah. to bring it into a price range where it's going to kind of can have the kinds of impact that you're talking about. My guess is, and I, I don't know exactly how this works in all of the European systems, but my guess is most of those have substantial subsidies yeah. um, in various ways that keep them there. And so as we um, yeah, develop those relationships deeper with the companies, and we're doing one right now where we're, we're trying to figure out if we can do a shared system that would also then help create the backbone of electric charging throughout the east side of San Jose, um, we're trying to see if we can um, yeah, if we can get that information in hand so we really understand what the proposal would look like and looking for grants um, to both help support the development of that and then, of course, once we get the information, the program itself. Thank you. I know this is hard, Ramses, so I appreciate that, you know, we're trying. This is not easy. Um, I'm guessing that with the subsidy, it's probably going to need to be some kind of vehicle purchase program um, as well that we would actually buy people's cars for them, uh, buy them off of them, rather, help them provide... Uh, help provide the subsidy that would make this thing work um, in any event. At, at least that's what I saw deployed in recently in my travels. They, the government was actually buying people's cars so they'll participate. You might remember the clunkers for, cl uh, cr for cash program that's that happened right. under, under Obama, right? Yeah. That, and that supposedly actually upgraded the, the fuel standards of our, of our whole fleet in the country by a substantial number. Yeah. It's an interesting idea. Yeah, it's one way to really accelerate and catalyze change. Um, then on the Climate Smart Challenge platform, which I love, is really cool. Um, but I just want you to know I signed up and tried to get through it. And I've heard this from one other person. If you have solar panels, it never uploads the data right, so it's, it's a little clunky and challenging. And I don't know if that's something you guys are already aware of, but for folks who have panels, apparently there's some, some glitches. I'm happy to talk offline. Um, but, but I'm glad to see we're, we've got the platform up and running. And, um, and hopefully we'll get more people jumping on board. Um, then finally, on, on the fuel cells, I just had a few questions. I, I went through the link in the report, in the footnote, to the CARB site, the California Air Resources Board site. Because um, I was trying to figure out, how do we get from 20 to 60 cells? And I, I, don't know, I didn't count the dots, but it looked like about 20 dots. So. What's carb missing that we think we found in these other 40 fuel cells? So our understanding at this point is that there really isn't one good data source. Oh, you know, that they're not tracking it for our purposes, right? So the, there's, um, there's not really a good data source. The um, additional um, number that I mentioned earlier is actually directly from a fuel cell company. So and that's only one company, so there could be more even than the 50. So, yeah. you know, we don't, there's not one source basically of, we tried to use as what was available online, but it's, it's, we have figured out it's not really yeah. the best way to do it. Thanks, Joey. So, so I went and I clicked on the little dots, and there apparently are multiple companies out there making these. I got one, Alter G Systems, uh, Relyon, and Genshure. And the reason why I'm meshing those two in particular, is because both of them list the fuel as hydrogen. Um, so somebody's got a hydrogen fuel cell <laughs> and they're deploying it in our city. Um, and so I hear people saying, well, hydrogen's not feasible. Uh, is that, now I, I, I know, we, we, we know it really only helps us move the ball forward if it's clean hydrogen, if it's hydrolysis that's been the result perhaps of using solar power or other, other, other clean energy. But 
Is that ample evidence that hydrogen fuel cells will work? <laughs> we got at least a couple of them here. Yeah, and there's, I mean, there's even other pilots out there as well. So um, I think the technology is definitely being tested out. Um, I think they're, from what we understand, and again, we're, you know, we're just barely beginning to dig into this issue. So there's definitely more work to be done around it. But, um, you know, there could, hydrogen could be both either on site or transport, you know, transported. And so it's, it depends on kind of, um, I think, you know, the cost part of it is what's the concern if you're depending right. on. So if somebody's chucking in hydrogen from somewhere else, then obviously that's not an ideal. Yeah, okay, got it. But if you had some on-site hydrolysis with solar, then we'd say, yippee, that's great. Yeah, I don't know enough about it, unfortunately, yeah. to, okay. to answer back. But, but you're correct in that, <laughs> yeah. that there's pilots David out David may know whether or not yippee I mean, actually exists. Hydrogen fuel cells work perfectly. They're great. Yeah. The issue is there's no hydrogen distribution system for hydrogen fuel. Right. So you have to make the hydrogen. You could truck it in. There are sources of hydrogen, but it's expensive to, to hydrolyze fossil fuels to make hydrogen. Right. Um, if you did it on site by having enough, enough solar energy to make the hydrogen that you then use in your fuel cell, you would have enough solar energy just to power your building. You wouldn't actually build an energy system so that you would create a new energy source, right? So yeah. that's, the, that's the, tr the true answer. Someday, maybe there would be a hydrogen distribution system for hydrogen fuel cells. That's what some of these fuel cell companies are banking on, but right now, we're a bit off from that. Yeah. Yeah, I know, I think Bloom's got a pilot in South Korea, but I don't know how far along that's coming. Okay, so I think what would be helpful, look, I'm not gonna be on the council whenever this comes back in 2023, so everybody good luck with that decision, but I, I, it would be helpful if we actually talk to the users, um, that is the companies who believe they need them, um, to really understand why they believe they need them, because I know we'll get a pretty predictable argument from the makers of these fuel cells. <laughs> and, and I think we know clearly what the argument is from, from the other side, from, from advocates who want to see them gone. Uh, it'd be helpful to know why people believe they need them. Um, because I, I frankly don't fully understand um, all the a solution either, because you're just going to get <laughs> the same emissions in some other city, uh, and, and we don't get the benefit of the employment or anything else. So I, I just want to understand, I would want to understand why users believe they need them. And some of these users are pretty, uh, pretty sophisticated, data centers and others, and they've probably been done a hell, heck of a lot of study and can at least tell us something. And I would hope that we would listen to them too. Great. Uh, thank you for, for hearing me out on that. Um, all right, let's go. Any other questions? Uh, Councilman Cohen? That was from before. Okay. Uh, I think that covers all the questions. Let's vote. Jimenez? Yes. Prowlis? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Trosco? Davis? Yes. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Licardo? Aye. Thank you. All right, thanks everybody. Oh, uh, we, oh yeah, we're gonna accelerate. Um, Jennifer told me we're already at four o'clock. So let's go to 8.3, which is the Mobile Home Park Land Use Designation Status Report. We have a presentation. And thanks for everybody else. Thanks to everybody else for waiting patiently. Sounds like it was getting worse today, and all these old bells are so awful. Now I want to actually pay attention. Yeah, the kid does a lot of like, he does like Dutch angles, but he does them to like, a lot of people do them now. But like, he really has his own, he's like the Thorane angle.
Yes, hi, Michael Brio, Deputy Director of Citywide Planning. I'm jo joined by uh, Rosalind Huey, uh, Deputy City Manager, and Chris Burton, Director of PBCE. Tonight we're gonna talk to you about an item that went to, I was gonna say t and &E, I think it was CED Committee, last month related to um, mobile home parks. So just, I'm gonna quick, I know make this fast today, but just really quickly, we've been working on a policy framework to both provide additional guidance on the closure requirements and process for mobile home parks, as well as a framework to discourage the closure of mobile home parks. We've been working on this through uh, 2015, since 2015, and I'm gonna skip very quickly through this and cut to the chase. Um, we were given direction, so we, we did change the land use designation at council's request on two mobile home parks, one in North San Jose and one in District 7 that were designated for uh, urban residential that were seen as having the greatest threat to conversion. Um, Council did direct us to come back with a budget request to change the land use designations to promote per, uh, preservation of the remaining 56 parks in San Jose. Um, and staff, that got sidetracked, quite frankly, by COVID. So as part of the budget process, this uh, in the, the current budget process that, end, or the current budget or the process that ended in June, we were uh, allocated $30,000 to um, change the general plan designation on five mobile home parks that were at the greatest risk of conversion. And that's, we did an analysis of that, we presented it to CED, and I'm gonna quickly run through that analysis. Um, so the first criteria we used are those parks that are designated residential neighborhood. Um, that's because these parks already allow residential use. In theory, you could redevelop them with, for example, single family homes if a property owner so desired without a general plan amendment. And there are 42 of the 56 parks have this general plan land use designation. Um, then we used a, um, a fiscal analysis of opportunity housing, also AKA what became in some ways SB9 housing that was done by Strategic Economics as part of the four year review, really as a proxy to understand um, the market for uh, townhomes really because that's the type of, of product we, could, we anticipated there could be market interest in developing or redeveloping mobile home parks for and for reasons I'll get in, into in a minute. So we, um, we looked at uh, all of the parks that were in tier one, which is a very strong market, and tier two, which is a moderately strong market. To, and we identified three parks only out of the 56 that were in the tier one or tier two market area, and that's Oak Crest, Lamp Lighter, and Quail Hollow. Um, the other reason the importance of this study and why we looked at the feasibility of townhomes is because of a provision in um, the residential neighborhood land use designation. Now the residential land use de designation, the, the density that is assigned or supported in that designation is eight dwelling units to the acre, which is your standard kind of single family home in and around downtown on like a 5,700 square foot lot. It's your typical land use designation throughout the city. However, it does have a provision if the prevailing density is greater than eight dwelling units to acre, you could develop up to 16 dwelling units to acre, which is right in that sort of ballpark of a, of a more traditional uh, townhome type of project. So that's, um, so we identified 12 parks total that um, where the prevailing density could um, support redevelopment um, into a townhome type density. So these we, we saw as definitely a, a priority for, um, uh, for, for uh, redesignation. Um, so then because we had $30,000, we could only do five. Um, we, what we did is we took the, 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 the first, the three that were in the top tier one and tier two, and then look at the, the remaining ones that had a prevailing density of 16 dwelling units or greater. 
and decided to pick the, to the, the largest two parks to add to get to a total of five. The reason for picking the largest two is one, it would have the most benefit for the most people. And also there was a thought that larger parks might be more, uh, there might be more of a desire incentive or to redevelop some of the larger parks. So just to reiterate, the five parks that um, we are recommending prioritizing through the $30,000 that Council gave us are Oak Crest, Lamplighter, Quail Hollow, Chateau de La Salle, Chateau de La Salle, I should know that my last name is Brio, um, and Mill Pond One. Um, the next, so the, before I get there, I just want to acknowledge the, the, the memo from Council Member Asparza, co-signed by Councilmember Foley, Jimenez, Perales, and Cohen. Um, and we just want to say that we support all of the recommendations in that memo, uh, including uh, including Mill Pond Two as to make it um, to make it thirteen. Um, I just want to put a shout out to Nancy Stevens who reached out and said, "Hey, what about us? We're, we're um, Mill Pond One. It's the same property, and why not batch us together?" So we agree with that. So in sum, we agree with all all of the recommendations in that um, in that memo. So um, we will be submitting a mid-year budget request to do um, the mobile home parks that are prioritized that council decides today we should prioritize for changing. Um, we would initiate general plan amendments uh, in, in, in the spring um, and um, <clears throat> we would do planning commissions, I would anticipate this summer or fall. We are looking at a really, as, as outlined in Asparza's, Council Member Asparza's memo, a much more um, streamlined approach to get this work done. And I would propose that we reach out to some of the leadership in the mobile home parks community, including Housing Commissioner Martha O'Connell and others to sort of help uh, come up with a strategy whereby we can get the information the mobile home park residents need to understand what's being proposed, but in a way that is much more expeditive and, and, and quicker and not as much uh, work so that we can actually get this work done faster and bring it to council. And with that, I will conclude and open up to questions or public comment, I guess, comes next. Thank you, Michael. Let's go to public comment. Starting with the in-person people, we have Linda. Um, if you're online and you want to raise your hand to speak, this is the time to do that. Um, if you're on the phone, press star six. No, wait, not star six. What is it to raise your hand? It is star six to raise your hand. And it looks like Linda's not here in the chambers anymore, so I'm going to go to Sona. is Donna Sanchez. I am speaking on be on the item 8.3. I live at Quail Hollow Mobile Home Park. I am requesting that the city council designate a plan necessary for the completion to amend the general plan land use designated for the 13 mobile home parks listed and also for the remaining parks in San Jose. Thank you very much. Okay, before I unmute the next speaker, it is star nine to raise your hand um, if you are on the phone. Nancy? Nancy, if you're on the, it looks like you're not on the phone. If you are, it's star six to unmute. There, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, good afternoon and thank you for this opportunity to speak. My name is Nancy Stevens and I live in the Mill Pond Senior Mobile Home Park community. You should have before you the email I sent to the city clerk regarding the matter of mobile home park land use designation. I included in my email the message I brought to the CED committee on September 26th, as well as a follow-up email I sent to planning, building and code enforcement the CED committee and city council members on the 27th of September. I would urge you to read the details on your own if you haven't already, but I want to emphasize my main points. We have visited this topic long enough. We need action. 
I support moving forward with the work to change the land use designation for the 13 parks assessed by staff. In addition, I would like the city council, I urge you to recognize Mill Pond 2 along with Mill Pond 1 in this process as they are owned and operated as one park. And I urge you to revisit and come up with a detailed plan committed to changing the land use designation for the remainder of the mobile home parks in San Jose. I do not know the amount of work or money it takes for this, but I sincerely hope it won't be another seven plus years before this matter can be 100% resolved. Please protect our homes. Thank you very much. Teresa. Hi, my name is Teresa Thornton and I live at Mill Pond One. And I am in favor of all mobile home parks receiving the mobile home park designation. Thank you for your time today. Bill Border. Hi, thank you. Uh, I live in Imperial Estates in District 10. And I have a lot of very specific questions that for the last seven years have not been answered by our planning department or housing department, despite my repeated requests. Um, I, I just hope that when you're all talking about doing the work and what's involved, I studied the Plan Bay area and I studied the Envision 2040 plan and all the notes and everything in our park in 2015, we were told that the Imperial Mobile Home States, because we were in a priority development area, just our park was attached to an existing priority development area. And that report was submit application was submitted to the Metropolitan Transportation Commitment, um, excuse me, yeah, I'm upset, sorry, the MTC. And so we've got this target on us, right? It's, it's we are in a priority development area. So I, while I appreciate the, the conversations around equity that, that are being done now, whereas they were not being done then, and I appreciate that 13 parks will be you know changed today i'm super grateful for that so yes on that but they all need to be changed and what i'd really like to know is is part of the work that needs to be done that we have to go back to the mtc or whatever and say yeah we've got to redraw all these maps and take these people out and all of this in addition to that the state law now says we have to align our zoning with our land use designation and my understanding is because of what is existing, we are here, we are present, we've been here for a long time, that then that should default to what we are, which is a mobile home. So I am not seeing what all of this work is that has to be done. And if somebody could describe the logistics of what it's going to take and why it takes so long, it would really help us understand, you know, all of this, these delays. Judy? Hello, this is Judy Erkanot, and I live in Quail Hollow Mobile Home Community. I, of course, support the mobile home park land use designation for my park and the others on this short list and the longer list. As you can see, it's quite an emotional issue, for especially for a lot of us seniors. And I know in my park, there are people who have lived here for 20 or 30 years and this myself I was, it was the only way I can afford to live back in San Jose where my children are and we've got a huge development of I don't know how many units going up across Bascom so it would be Bascom at Southwest Expressway and this this park is just a smallish community that just needs to be kept as it is for the sake of all of us seniors who need somewhere affordable that we can live in the valley. Thank you. Call in user one. Martha O'Connell, regional manager for GSMO Well, representing thousands of mobile home park residents in San Jose. I will call out a sentence in the Esparza et al. memo. We know very well where the community stands on this. Their support has been consistent and unwavering. As proof of that, I have submitted 196 pages of emails from March 2020 
making these same arguments that people have been making with the more recent emails that they have been sending in on the last in the last two weeks. So the council is well aware of where we stand. We don't need a lot of outreach. The people just want it done. I am a fiscal conservative, and I think this is a reasonable and prudent strategy to preserve affordable housing in San Jose. The original 300,000, which was requested to, to do this for five parks, that's what you would pay for 3.75 tiny homes. So it seems to me that this is, is money extremely well spent. I would also give a shout out to all the mobile home residents who have been waiting for years for this. They are exhausted. They're emotionally and physically exhausted. And I'm gonna quote Winston Churchill. Now is not the end. It is not even the beginning of the end, but it is perhaps the end of the beginning. So please vote to approve the Esparza memo and let's move forward and put mobile home residents in a situation where they can sleep well at night. Thank you. Caller 2684, please press star six to unmute. So my name is Rebecca Aiello. I live at the Chateau LaSalle. I've been living here with me and my family for the past 15 years. Um, just in my community, I know we have a beautiful community here. I don't think that this is a place for pickings for uh, new townhomes. I am definitely in favor of the mobile home park land use designation. Please, we need to stop having the fear that our homes are going to be taken away. There is enough going on in this city. You have committees for homelessness. Please don't make the rest of us homeless and having to find a new way. Just protect our homes. That's all we're asking for. If you need places for townhomes, there are designated areas everywhere. I see new stores going up, new Costco's. Please redesignate that land use for new homes. Stop picking on the places that are already exist. Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. And have a wonderful okay. day. Caller 9016. Press star six to unmute. Again, caller 9016. Hello, my name is Diane. I'm from uh, West Winds, and I would just like to say that I'm very grateful for all the uh, proceedings that, that you have done. And I just, I'm from the seniors are so important. We just can't move. Um, it's extremely difficult. Uh, to move after you've lived in some in a place for 25 years um, and it's very important that all the mobile homes all the mobile home parks get included but thank you so much for the work that you have done and I just know that you're going to continue thank you very much caller one five four one um, this caller is our last um, caller. We so if hi, you, my name is Glenna Croft, uh, MOL chapter president. Um, I would like to thank Michael Brio for his mobile home status report, and council members Esparza, Foley, Jimenez, Perales, and Cohen for their recent memorandum. A wise man once said, "Hope deferred makes the heart sick." But when the desire comes, it is a tree of life. Our hopes to have the mobile home designation issue resolved in a reasonable time have instead morphed into disillusionment, distrust, anger, and contempt. Allow me to offer a caveat. If you really value the trust and respect of your constituents, fulfill the promise that you made to us over two and a half years ago. Adopt the Esparza, Foley, Jimenez, Perales, and Cohen Memorandum. We have waited long enough for this to be resolved. It is time to put an end to the stress 
and the anxiety that we've, we've all experienced that has monopolized the lives of mobile home residents for the last seven plus years. It is time to redesignate all mobile home parks. Thank you so much for your time. Call in user two. Sorry about that. Call in user two, press star six to unmute. Hello, this is Joan McKay from Quail Hollow, and I've been a resident in this park for about 19 years, and I am very distressed that it has taken seven years and more for the land designation, mobile home land designation to be issued to our parks and the other communities on the list. You know, it's we sit here, and it's the city council we talk to, and then the city council passes the issue off to the committees, and the committee then hires a subcommittee, and then the subcommittee needs to hire a consultant. It's really hard to understand how any work gets done with all of this, with this issue being passed off so many times in seven years. You know, we are the seniors in, in this park, and we built this community with our blood, sweat, and tears. We need your consideration. We don't need to wait another year uh, for this designation to be issued for all of our mobile home parks. Thank you very much for your time. On when? On your unmuted, go ahead. On. Back to council. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Sparta. Thank you, Mayor. Um, thank you to the planning team for all your hard work on this. Um, thank you, a big thank you to all the mobile home residents who have spoken up consistently and made your voices heard, and you've been doing this for the past seven years. We've heard a loud, clear, and consistent message from our mobile home residents that you want your parks and homes protected and want to feel secure in your homes. I'd also like to thank my colleagues for their resolute support of mobile homes. Um, Councilmember Foley, who chairs the CED committee, Councilmembers Jimenez, Perales, and Cohen. Um, a few comments. So first of all, I'd like, I think it's really important to recognize that all of this is work that the council approved back in March 2020. We asked staff to carry out the work to apply the new mobile home land use designation to all 58 mobile home parks in San Jose. And so the conversation that we've had since then at budget earlier this year and at the CED committee, it's really about the resources needed to carry out direction that we've already given. And I'd also like to bring up that completing this work for all of our parks will protect over 10,000 homes with over 35,000 residents. So in all the housing presentations that we've, that we've listened to at council, we've talked about protecting and preserving as two of the three Ps of our affordable housing strategies. Well, this is an opportunity to do that on a large scale and for a lot less than the millions of dollars that we would spend on other affordable housing measures. So when we talk about protecting and preserving affordable housing, this is about the biggest bang for our buck that we're ever going to have and we need to take advantage of that. In light of staff's analysis, we did want to protect or to prioritize completing work on the 13 most at-risk parks, and we included Mill Pond 2 along with Mill Pond 1 in that list because they are functionally the same community. I know Councilmember Davis and I, before COVID, would go together um, to meet with that community. And that's why we ask that staff return as part of the mid-year budget review with the request for resources that they need to complete this work this year, this fiscal year. But really, we need a detailed plan and timeline for all of the parks. So we ask that staff return as part of the budget process 
with that multi-year plan along with the needed funding. As this work is also part of our housing element plan, we'd like to align the timeline in the housing element with this work. And I understand that the housing element will be returning to council at about the same time as our budget process, so it makes sense to incorporate this timeline into the final version of the housing element. We also understand that the public outreach process is often a major time-consuming part uh, of the work of the general plan amendment process. And so we want to encourage staff to look at ways to streamline this process, especially because we already know, we already know where our mobile home residents stand on this work and that they just wanna see it done. I know that we have two processes that we are ongoing right now. We have the land use and rezoning work that's ongoing as part of our housing element work and we have the conforming rezonings for SB 1333. So my question is, is there a way that we can leverage that process to make our mobile home work more efficient? Can we tie it to that work? And is there a way for us to simply notice residents and park owners about this work um, rather than creating more community meetings with communities and residents who have already voiced their support for this work? Yeah, so the, yeah, the general answer is yes. So the idea is that we would hire um, a peak staffer to get all this work done. Um, that peak staffer would report to the team that is aligning the zoning with the general plan and be part of that larger team's effort. Um, and we were definitely, uh, going to explore ways to really expedite this. I mean, we want to do it sort of in conjunction with getting feedback from people in mobile home parks to some of the leadership there to understand how it works. But we have thoughts of like, we, you know, maybe we have one community meeting, quite frankly, for all of the parks. We do one hearing for all 56 parks and not separate them out or batch them up. So those are the kind of things that we're, we're going to explore because it's very clear that um, people want it to want it to get done faster, and I, I I don't think you know when we did the mobile home park conversion ordinance that was a lot more contentious. There's a lot of more concerns. It could have gone different directions. I think this is very clear that people that live in the parks want this. So so yes. Okay, thank you. And if we do one um, one meeting, I think I think I did the first hybrid community input meeting, um, and so we had a physical meeting but there were ways for folks to call in similar to a city council meeting. Um, and I, I, I don't think that you would have residents arguing with a simplified and streamlined approach. All right, thank you for that. I, lastly, I, I just wanna urge all of my colleagues to support moving this work forward, giving our thousands of families and our seniors the peace of mind that we are doing everything that we can to protect their homes. We unanimously, voted to do this work. Let's keep our word to our residents and make sure that staff has the resources they need and a clear timeline to complete it. And with that, I'd like to move the memo forward. Second. All right, motion from Councilmember Spars, the second from Councilmember Foley. Other members of the council would like to speak? I just had a couple quick questions. Um, I'm certainly gonna support this. My understanding is with the mandate of the state now to align general plan and zoning, we'd have to do this anyway. Isn't that right? Okay. So, and we did direct this to happen a few years ago. Obviously, we didn't have the resources to make it all happen. We're going to look for ways to consolidate and accelerate, and that's a good thing. Um, to whatever extent this takes time, and I know it always takes more time than anybody wants, I just don't want people feeling like they're at great risk of losing their home because it feels like, from what I'm hearing in public testimony, there's a lot, of, a lot of anxiety out there, and I'm a little concerned that some of that anxiety may be generated by not fully accurate information. And my understanding is several years ago, and I think it started in 2015, we implemented a series of steps that would require any applicant really to go through the council if they were gonna try to replace mobile home park with anything else. And there would have to be 
a very substantial uh, package to compensate uh, mobile home park residents, the mobile home owners, um, and uh, a very extensive process. And the time we put that in place, we believed that was about, uh, that was, that's at least as, as onerous on a developer, probably far more so than a general plan amendment would be. <laughs> uh, it would take a whole lot more time and a whole lot more money. And I, I just want to make sure I'm checking my <laughs> assumptions here. Is, is, is that a fair statement? Yeah, I mean, that, that is correct. That's why and staff's response to councils um, uh, ask in council's direction, we actually responded with a memo that said that um, we, you know, we understood why people wanted this, but the protections that the council had already approved were already in place to, to do that, and the council would ultimately have to make a decision anyway. So right. it adds another thing that has to be done, but the council, it becomes a political decision, and it's also a financial one, because there's all the stuff you have to do to get through right. the process. Right. Um, so, yes. Okay. Thank you, Michael. And certainly we've seen that play out on the Winchester site. I mean, there was a very substantial settlement. Um, and I can assure anyone who has any questions, that was a whole lot harder than just a simple general plan amendment. Um, so I guess I want to assure those who are watching and listening that, first of all, you're, you're not in peril if this takes a few months to get done. <laughs> this is going to take some time. Um, and the protections that were put in place are in place, and it, it's a very, very large obstacle for anybody to redevelop. Uh, that being said, even after we do everything, if we do everything perfectly, it's still going to be up to six members of the council today or 10 years from now to decide there's going to be a di different land use, and that's not going to change, and there's going to be nothing guaranteed in that. And so if there's some developer out there that wants to go through that extensive, laborious, and very expensive process that we set up back in 2015 to 17, and they get a general plan amendment, and they get six votes on the council, they're gonna do it. Now, I happen to think that's extremely unlikely based on everything we know, but I just don't want people either A, having an unnecessary amount of anxiety, or B, having a false sense of security. <laughs> uh, in, in either case, the world is not gonna change dramatically regardless, because the barriers are in place today, and when we put more barriers in place in the months ahead, um, it's still gonna be up to six members of the council and a developer, um, and obviously a very extensive community process. So uh, I hope that people feel a little better knowing that the protections are in place to make it extremely unlikely, and I hope uh, that we can move forward in a way that's, that's collaborative and, and, and assures everybody the full extent of the law that we're doing everything we can. Um, okay, we have a motion. Let's vote. Jimenez? Jimenez? Perales? Perales? Wait, am I muted? Jimenez? I apologize. I stepped away. I was just checking to see if I was somehow not muted. Or I'm, I was checking my microphone. Um, so I'll go back to Perales. Cohen? Aye. Carrasco? Aye. Davis? Yes. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Foley? Mahan? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Licardo? Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, we're on to item 6.3. I should say we're going back to item 6.3, which we're going to hear. We're not hearing that concurrently with 8.4, right? Because I guess we are. Yeah, okay. We're going to hear both 6.3 and 8.4. That's the Building Reach Code Ordinance and the building, California Building Standards Code Adoption. We're going to vote on them separately, but we're going to hear them together. So here we go. Welcome, everybody.
Um, good afternoon or evening, I guess now. Um, I'm Amanda Leonis with Environmental Services, and I'll be presenting today on the updated San Jose Building Reach Code for Julie Benaventi. So the city's current building reach code um, must be aligned with the updated 2022 California Energy Standards and 2022 Cal Green and readopted in order for the reach code to remain in effect. Um, today, the staff is not proposing any additional provisions uh, beyond the existing reach code requirements as this is an administrative update. The city must use um, cost effectiveness studies to support amendments to the California energy standards requiring any increased energy efficiency um, for mixed fuel new construction. And staff um, proposing continuation of electrical, electric vehicle charging infrastructure requirements at this time um, since cost effectiveness studies are not required to adopt those amendments from Cal Green. Oops. Okay, so some next steps. Um, staff is bringing the remainder of the Title 24 amendments to the 2022 Building and Fire Codes to City Council today, which you will be hearing next um, for those to become effective at the first of the year 2023. Um, environmental services staff will return um, by December of this year, 22, with an update regarding multifamily electric vehicle charging infrastructure changes to the building reach code. And staff will also return um, to council with additional proposed reach code updates once those cost effectiveness studies are available. And here listed are the staff recommendations. Um, thank you, and I'll pass it now to Lisa. Good afternoon, Lisa Joyner, Deputy Director of the Building Division, and I'm joined with Deputy Chief and our Fire Marshal, Chief Dobson. And so we're talking about the building code and fire code updates. So as Amanda mentioned, every three years we go through this process. This coming January, we will be adopting the 2022 California Building Codes based on the 2021 International Building Code. And this in turn translates to Title 24 in the Municipal Code for the Building Code and Title 17 for the Fire Code. So jurisdictions are permitted to modify the state adopted building standards as long as the modifications are deemed necessary due to special local climatic, geological, or topographical conditions that could affect our residents. We live in a densely populated area with potential for high seismic activity. So significant damage from earthquakes is a concern and we're also concerned about increased hazard for the spread, magnitude, and severity of potential fires within the city. So this allows us to create local amendments to the state codes. Uh, and from code cycle to code cycle, things move around and section references change. So we have the opportunity to update the municipal code to ensure code references and languages match the new building code. And we're also able to eliminate any local amendments that have been adopted in the, the new codes. So our recommendations for Title 24. We will retain the four amendments we currently have related to building separations, special testing and inspections for concrete foundations, and gypsum board and braced wall panels, which disallow the use of certain materials and construction methods like gyp board or stucco as lateral resisting elements as they don't perform well in seismic events. And we are not proposing any additional amendments to the 2022 California Building Codes. And now I will pass it over to Chief Dobson. Good afternoon, Mayor Licardo, Vice Mayor Jones, council members, city staff, and the residents of San Jose. I'm James Dobson, Deputy Chief and Fire Marshal of the San Jose Fire Department. The San Jose Fire Department is committed to serving the community by protecting life, property, and the environment through prevention and response. We work collaboratively with other fire marshals and agencies within the county 
to establish not only the adoption process, but the amendments that we are presenting. The San Jose Fire Department is recommending the following adoptions. Uh, one is for seven, Title 1712, which covers the 2022 fire code, as well as Title 1768, which covers the hazardous material storage permit. For the Title 1712, 2022 fire code, the recommendations are to retain four amendments to the two, the, sorry, uh, nine, to repeal, sorry, 19 amendments uh, to the current amendments. Many of these are due to ordinance is being adopted directly into the model code. We are also reverting to uh, standards in the 2022 California Fire Code. We are modifying 31 amendments. Uh, thank you. The amendments are being modified for minor clarity corrections and long-term long -term po policy codification. Uh, we are making one additional amendment, uh, which is a, the inspection, testing, and maintenance requirements. We have an adoption to notify the inspection compliance service company that is contracted with the City of San Jose for all of their testing and maintenance. And we propose to retain 85 uh, amendments that are currently adopted. Thank you. For Title 1768, the Hazardous Materials Storage Permit, we are modifying seven amendments. These amendments are modified for minor clarity corrections and utilizing the 2022 California Fire Code definitions. We're also removing invalid and legacy notification requirements uh, that provided uh, confusion for our customers. We are retaining 71 uh, amendments uh, associated with the hazard material storage permit amendments. And I'm gonna pass it back to Lisa. And our next steps are just that in early 2023, we will provide training sessions to design professionals, developers, contractors, um, to highlight the significant changes between the 2019 and 2022 California codes. So that concludes our presentation and we're available for questions. Thank you. We'll now go to public comments. Linda? Hi, Linda Hutchins Knowles, San Jose resident. You'll see I've changed shirts. I'm now here in my capacity as Actera's e mobility and advocacy senior manager. Um, Actera is actively engaged in helping electrify both buildings and transportation, and we wish to thank you very much for your reach code. Um, when it was established three years ago, it was fantastic, and we're glad that you are keeping up with the code. Um, I know that you're gonna be coming back with a study on EV charging infrastructure, so I just wanna do a little foreshadowing. Um, I appreciated very much the mayor, Raul Perales, and I forget, I apologize, the others who signed onto a memo on Earth Day regarding um, doing a study on the feasibility of moving the reach code for EV charging to 95% EV ready and 5% EVSE, which is the charging stations. And I wanna encourage you very much to consider this seriously, and I hope there's a chance for those of us experts to take a look at that before it comes back to presentation. Um, Actera and the EV Charging for All Coalition that we co-lead has advocated with the state um, uh, housing and community development for even more stringent standards. And we, this is a very serious equity issue. When you live in a multifamily housing apartment or condo and you don't have access to charging, you're very unlikely to get an electric vehicle. That locks you into having to pay these exorbitant prices for gas or maybe rely on public transit. San Jose Clean Energy has established some very good programs um, for EV charging, um, fast charging in um, the east side and other neighborhoods where there's not as much infrastructure. I do really wanna make sure you everybody understands EV capable and EV ready are very different for multifamily housing residents. And so EV ready means you can pull in, it's ready to charge. EV capable means 
the, some of the structure is laid there. There's some conduit or some, um, I'm not going to explain this well, but it's not ready. You have to hire an electrician. You have to pull a permit. Um, you have to pay for it, get permission of your building manager. This is a huge hurdle for apartment and condo residents. It's unfair. And so the way the code was written was very good when it was adopted, but it was mostly EV capable, I think 70%. And so thank you, Mayor. You weren't here when I gave my thanks. But thank you so much for um, asking for a study of how we can go to 95% EV ready. The 5% EVSE is just to comply thank with you. the state. That's the minimum they require. Thank you. But is that all time I have? Yeah. OK, as an EV driver and mother, thank you for considering this. I'm back to the council. Thank you, thank you, Linda. All right, uh, back to the council. I don't see anyone's Move hands. Move approval. Second. second. All right, there's a motion and second. Let's vote. Jimenez? Yes. Prowlis? Prowlis? Cohen? I, I assume this is on both items together oh you know what that's right we have to separate <laughs> vote on we have to vote them on time. separately oh okay yep. so this will be on so 6.3 6 first let's okay. take that at 6.3 first uh, Roscoe Aye. I said oh. Davis yes Esparza yes Arenas yes Foley aye Mahan aye Jones aye Ricardo aye um, I'm gonna go back to Prowlis he did text a yes vote on the last item and said he was having difficulties. So if he texts me on this one, I'll let you guys know. Now go to eight more. Sorry, sorry, Tony, I, I'm, I am breaking up here, but I am a yes. Okay, thank you. I'll move approval of 8.4. Second. Okay, let's vote on that motion. Jimenez? Yes. Prowlis? Prowlis? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Roscoe? Aye. Davis? Yes. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Licardo? Aye. Thank you. All right. Let's go to item 8.1, which are actions related to some land over on West St. John Street and North Montgomery Street. Um, actually known as Lottie, but not to be confused with the police parking lot. <laughs> Welcome, Nancy and team. Hi, Kevin. Mayor, Nancy Klein, Office of Economic Development. Good afternoon to you, Mayor and Council. Um, Nancy Klein, Director of Economic Development and Cultural Affairs. I'm here with Kevin Ice from uh, Economic Development and Cultural Affairs. And in the audience, available for questions, um, are Cameron Day, and on the Zoom are Arian, Colin, and Jessica Zank. As you may have noted, we have very long recommendations for you on this item, mm -hmm. but at the crux uh, of those several pages of recommendations, um, we're asking for council support to adopt an addendum to the downtown strategy 2040 final EIR and the associated mitigation monitoring and reporting plans. Also asking for authorization of relocation assistance for 517 West St. John Street. In addition, adopting a resolution determining the public interest and necessity are, that are required through the acquisition through condemnation for the 15, 517 West St. John Street property and the 150 North Montgomery Street property, including all necessary findings and declarations by law in conformance with Cal Civil procedures code section 1245.221, et cetera, and authorizing the city attorney to begin legal proceedings for eminent domain and to seek an order for possession. Next. The background here, and we will be brief, is that in 2016, a dispute arose between the Trammell Crow folks, city, and sharks. And the issue was 
uh, the ability for the city to retain our parking obligations in light of the then Trammell Crow uh, project moving forward. A settlement agreement was created and the settlement agreement obligates the city to acquire parcels needed to construct a lot E parking facility, and we're gonna show you an aerial in just a second. And in order to do so, the city has been negotiating the purchase of properties in that area since 2016. We've already purchased two properties as noted above, that was in 2017. And just to give you the language directly from the settlement agreement and which is embedded in the arena management agreement, the city will make good faith efforts to purchase the parcels as soon as reasonably possible using the city's condemnation powers if necessary, which rights shall be exercised only in the sole discretion of when the city council and only after the city council has adopted a resolution of necessity, which is what we're asking for today. And just briefly, you'll see at the bottom the two um, properties that are already have already been acquired by the city, 140 North Montgomery and 525 West St. John. And the two properties we're talking about today are 517 West St. John, known as the Thorson Properties, and 150 North Montgomery Street, which is the property owned by the Jimenez family. And with that, I'll turn this over to Kevin. Thanks, Nancy. Thanks, Nancy. Uh, hi, my name is Kevin Ice. I'm the real estate manager in the Office of Economic Development and Cultural Affairs. The city has been negotiating uh, for a consensual transaction to acquire these two properties. We commissioned appraisals in 2021 that valued 517 West St. John at 4.8 million and 150 North Montgomery at 1.77 million, each valued at roughly $250 a square foot. Both properties are located in the Deridon Station area plan, and they both have a highest and best use of assembling the property with adjacent properties to construct a large-scale commercial development. The city initially offered our appraised values to the owners, uh, including 1033 letters. These offers were unsuccessful, and the owners countered at five and a half million for West St. John and three and a half million for 150 North Montgomery. In an effort to settle on price and, and achieve a consensual transaction, the city then offered above our appraised values, uh, five million for 517 West St. John and 1.925 million for 150 North Montgomery uh, with IRS section 1033 letters included as well, which provides uh, tax advantages. Both offers were again rejected. We've commissioned updated appraisals and our appraiser indicated that he believes the market has weakened in the past year and that the price may go down in our updated reports. And then finally, uh, deposits will be required after filing in court and the court would decide the deposit amount. We anticipate up to 6,570,000 uh, being necessary, which is the combined estimated fair market value of the properties. Uh, so a little more about the properties. Uh, 517 West St. John is 0.44 acres in size, located at the northeast corner of West St. John Street and Barack Obama Boulevard. Uh, it has a 10,000 square foot industrial building constructed in 1939. Uh, the building is home to two occupants, Thorson Tile and Stone and Shark Sports and Entertainment. Uh, Thorson Tile and Stone would require relocation assistance. Uh, the Sharks have agreed to waive any claims to relocation assistance. The Deridon Station Area Plan indicates that the property is included in the outer safety zone overlay of the airport and therefore residential uses are restricted to minimize the number of people exposed to potential aircraft accidents in the vicinity of the airport. The owner of 517 West St. John commissioned an appraisal with Valbridge Property Advisors that valued the property at $5.5 million, uh, 700000 above our appraisal. A city commissioned review appraisal of the Valbridge report found that it failed to appropriately analyze the use restrictions from the safety zone overlay and therefore inappropriately used comparable sales with residential uh, tower potential without adjustments for the safety zone, thus inappropriately inflating the appraised value. The city has been negotiating with the owners for eight years now, having first made an offer to purchase the property in 2016 
and making subsequent offers in 2018 and 2021 uh, prior to the currently active offer. Staff will continue to engage the owners and develop any opportunity to achieve a consensual transaction. The owners have indicated that they're willing to continue negotiations and staff have renewed the city's offer of $5 million despite our appraiser's anticipated weakness in the market over the past year. Uh, the 150 North Montgomery property is roughly 7,000 square feet. It's a vacant lot. The owners purchased the property in 2002 for $275,000. Uh, there are no active plans for development. The city is required to pay up to 5,000 of the property owner's appraisal fees. Uh, despite our offering to pay the fee, the owners did not commission an appraisal. They countered the city's offer at 3,500,000, uh, citing that their price isn't based on market data, but rather what feels appropriate to them. Uh, our increased offer of $1,925,000, or $272 a square foot, failed to spark a dialogue. Uh, with that, I'll turn it back to Nancy. Just a couple, thank you, Kevin, and just a couple notes in summary. Today we're asking for actions consistent with the city's already existing settlement agreement uh, that is embedded with the arena management agreement. Again, these require that the city purchase the Lot E properties to create a parking facility that will support not only uh, the SAP operations, but also Deer Don activities. We have made numerous good faith uh, more than good faith efforts to come to agreement, and that in order to move forward, we are asking council to support the actions described today, and in the same time frame, we will continue to negotiate with the owners to reach accord prior to moving forward with eminent domain. With that, count, council, thank you very much, and staff is available for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Cameron, Kevin, and Nancy for your patience. I know this has not been easy. <laughs> Let's go to the public. Blair Beekman. I know with issues around uh, the city of Santa Clara and it's I, in a certain area of the city is having uh, new housing issues where they want to offer a future of uh, less less parking. And I know the same in uh, uh, District 1, uh, Councilperson Vice Mayor Jones District, you know, you have a real ambitious feature of, you know, building, uh, you know, uh, low income housing and, and moderate income housing uh, mix ideas with, with no parking issues, uh, with, with minimal, less, fewer parking issues as well. Overall, San Jose has a really ambitious plan for downtown and a future of uh, less parking overall. Uh, I'm really, it's a really exciting plan and it's hopeful. Um, I, I hope you guys can be clear how to make that more understandable and, and really workable because uh, a future of less cars and reliance on single occupancy vehicles, that's really cool concepts you guys are working on. I really hope you guys can uh, work to make that into a reality. And and because I'm down here in San Diego, we're going through some of the same issues. I've mentioned your ambitious good ideas, and it, it would be, I, I wish it could be more than just ambition, and it can really be put to practical use. And good luck on all of our efforts, how we can do that uh, in the up, uh, upcoming decades. With that said, uh, with the, I guess the upcoming decade. With that said, um, I also wanted to uh, put out there uh, is the future of this sort of uh, purchase is it with the intent to possibly one day move the sharks from the arena and use the arena as some sort of a deer on station planning purpose? And if it is, can we start to have those conversations openly now instead of uh, five or 10 years down the road? Sorry to uh, ask such a question. I hope it can be relevant and uh, good luck how to address such a question. Thank you. Victor Gomez. Honorable Mayor Licardo and City Council members, this is Victor Gomez, Government Affairs Consultant with the San Jose Downtown Association. Um, I'm here to speak on behalf of the Downtown Association in favor of the staff recommendation as outlined in your presentation, including the acquisition of all necessary land uh, for this parking facility. 
Uh, the Lot E footprint has been planned and located in a manner which is compatible with the greatest public good and the least private impact to assemble the parking necessary for those surrounding uses. It's unfortunate that we have ended up at this point, but we're glad to see that the city is taking these critical steps uh, to acquire these properties. Uh, with that said, we just wanted to keep it brief and uh, say we are in full support of these actions and we ask for your full support. Thank you. Back to the council. Thank you. Back to the council, council member Cohen. Yeah, thank you. Uh, this is just a question out of my uh, naivete. Um, I am not familiar with the greater, with the uh, general purpose parking capital fund itself, where this is being funded. Can you explain that to me just a, briefly and how much is in the fund and what portion will be left after these acquisitions? I think if Arian is on the line, we certainly have that information outlined, but if Arian is on the line, he would be the best to respond. And he may not, there's kid duty um, yeah, I'll, that he had I'll, to. I'll, I'll take that question another time to learn more about that fund. I don't need to learn it right now, but. There's approximately a little more than 10 million in the fund currently, okay. and it's sufficient at what, what we're asking for, it will be uh, a, a different strategy uh, to come and build the facility when, when that's appropriate. Okay, and then there's a, there are other properties that make up that entire city block. Are the, is this the lot E a portion of the block or do, are there, there's obviously more properties that need to be acquired too? Well, the, these last parcels, oh, do you mind putting back up the, I just wanna make, it's easier if we see the picture. The, the picture you're about to see will identify where we are talking about the, the parking facility. Let's see. The, so the aerial there, if you can. Oh, there we go. I can flip. Thank you. There we go. So the outline of the area marked in red right. is the area we're talking about. The Sharks own two parcels to the north on the east side. And they would put those in for a dollar, uh, is the current agreement. And there's one other parcel that we would have yet to acquire. For the rest of those properties, I see there's four marked here, but there's another six properties, but the rest are owned by appropriately, and we just have one additional parcel then. Right, and, and I neglected to say that the parcel on the west side, the second parcel down, is a home owned by Google, and it's our understanding they will donate the, the <coughs> land and the house will be moved. Okay. So yes, just one more parcel. Just one more parcel, <coughs> excuse me, to make up the entire footprint of the parking lot. Okay, thank Sorry. you. Thank you. Other questions? Okay. Uh, do we have a motion? No, wait, wait, Here, here's how we're gonna do it. We're gonna take A and B first. Then we're going to take C, then we're going to take D, just to make it complicated on everybody. So let's first take A and B together. Is there a motion? Second. second. Thank you, Councilmember Jimenez. And I'll give a second to Vice Mayor. Let's vote. Jimenez? Yes. Morales? Yes. Morales? Thank you. Cohen? Aye. Rosco? Aye. Davis? Yes. Esparza? Arenas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Licardo? Aye. All right, next on subsection C of the recommendation. Your motion. So moved. Second. Okay, and we need two thirds vote for this to pass. All right, let's vote. Jimenez? Yes. Morales? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Frosco? Aye. Davis? Yes. Esparza? Texted you. Yes? Yes. Foley? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Licardo? Aye. Thank you. And finally, D, is there a motion? So moved. Still moved. All right, I'll take that as a second, Councilmember Davis. Let's vote. Jimenez? Yes. Morales? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Roscoe? Aye. Davis? 
Yes. Esparza texted yes. Arenas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Mayhan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Lutardo? Aye. Thank you. Okay, I think we did it. All right, here we go. Um, let's go on then. Thanks, everybody. Let's go on to open forum. Blair Beekman? That's it. Hi, uh, Blair Beekman here. Thanks for the meeting today. Um, I am really looking forward to the meeting tomorrow uh, at Rules and Open Government to talk about the future of uh, Vision Zero issues and the concepts of uh, not just uh, technology questions around our schools, but how um, open public policies can can really help the process around the schools to to explain to young kids what what a real comprehensive future of, of neighborhood safety can be about and explaining those sort of efforts to school kids i think can get them excited and hopeful and uh about the future so uh, i'm looking forward to the meeting tomorrow and uh i i i don't quite know what else to say at this time i'm still hoping for the concepts of peace negotiation uh and not war Loud, loud car, sorry. In the Ukraine area, uh, if, if we're going to be doing the same things, if we're going to be negotiating in the same terms in two years time, what I hope we can just do start those practices now. And I would much prefer to do that. If we can see into the future two years from now and know how this war is going to turn out, why don't we start practicing the concepts of negotiation now. Um, uh, and I also had a few other comments to say that I guess I will save. Uh, for tomorrow at uh, Rules and Open Government. And overall, uh, thank you for the meeting. Good luck how uh, we work on our issues now and we move forward uh, into the future past uh, November election time. And uh, it's a learning process for all of us. And uh, just uh, thanks to everybody's good work over the years. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Blair. Back to council. Okay, uh, everybody, today is the opening day for the NBA season, so go dub. Uh, everybody have a wonderful evening. Meetings adjourned. Um, I thought the meeting would go longer, so there is dinner in the back. <laughs>